Hear ye, hear ye. This meeting of the Smart Cities and Service Improvements Committee is now called to order. Can we do roll call, please? Sure. Councilmember Jimenez? Here. Councilmember Davis? Here. Councilmember Vice Mayor Jones? Here. Chair Landier? Present. We have a quorum. All right. Looking at the work plan, does anybody have any suggestions to change? Seeing none, I would like to recommend that we move item number two to uh, report last. Is that okay with everybody? Yeah. Do we have a second or anything or do we? No, we're fine, right? All right, let's go on. Um, no consent calendar. All right, reports, go ahead, Dolan, take it away. Great, thank you, Chair. So good afternoon, um, committee members, Mr. Chair, members of the public and city staff. Dolan Beckel here, Director of the Office of Civic Innovation, joined here at the dais with Smart City Manager, Regine Nair, and from the Office of Economic Development, Sal Alvarez. Um, continuing my commitment to Chair Dieppe to provide more infotainment at this committee, it's time for our first ever Smart City Roadmap Committee Quiz. This quiz is directly related to the agenda items and should help foster some innovation and out-of-the-box thinking by our committee members. So, for the first of our two quizzes, what do these three things have in common? Devil's Post, Mo Devil's Post Pile National Monument, WWE Superstar Dwayne Johnson, and the Autonomous Vehicles First and Last Mile Pilot. Anyone? Bueller, Jones, anyone? They are all big rocks. <laughs> all right, Council Member Davis is analyzing the data. She's seeing trends in the patterns, and I think she's going to get the next one. What do these three things have in common? The Hope Diamond, Ruth Batter Ginsburg, and San Jose's Startup and Residence Custom Street Banner Program. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> Council Member Davis wins a free trip up the elevator to the 18th floor. <laughs> okay, with that exhilarating exercise, let's walk through our agenda. Uh, what you're starting to see here emerge is a more standard agenda on a monthly basis that will always provide a Smart City Roadmap update, a highlight of a small wonder project. In this case, it will be our uh, startup and residence a highlight of a big rock, in this case it'll be our autonomous vehicles, and a demonstration associated with a small wonder or a big rock, in which case this will be the demonstration of our street light banner platform that you're gonna see today. Uh, so this is the agenda we'll go through. We'll start off with an, a regular update of the Smart City Roadmap by Regine. Uh, we'll be joined by the Chief Information Officer, Rob Lloyd, to give us an IT strategic plan update and an audit update. Um, those topics generally a little more dry, so we'll bookend the demonstration with the autonomous vehicle strategy update from, uh, from Jill North and the Department of Transportation. So having said that, I'm going to turn the presentation on roadmap reporting over to Smart City Manager Regine Nair. All right. Thank you, Dolan. All right. And thank you. Welcome, Mr. Chair. Um, well, Mr. Mayor is not here. So, and members of the committee and also the public, my name is Regine Nair. I'm the Smart City Manager for the Civic Innovation Team. So last month, uh, we presented to the committee the status of 38 high-priority projects identified on the Smart City Roadmap. Uh, these high-priority projects uh, include both the IT Roadmap and also the Innovation at Scale, which is now famously known as our Big Rocks. And uh, just a quick re recap, the projects are prioritized from left to right, as demonstrated on the uh, arrow diagram shown below. Also, we presented to the committee and the public that we use a traffic light status for reporting purposes, and the color key is shown on the bottom right hand of the slide. Uh, the green, which is the top color, referring to the uh, projects that are on status, are on track. Yellow color in the middle just refers to the projects that have any uh, issues with schedule, budget, or scope. And then the red color, which is the color on the bottom, uh, indicating any projects at risk or any cor corrective courses of actions that are required. So where we are this month, the month of April, uh, uh, basically the project status have uh, remained relatively the same as last month. Um, there is one change, uh, and that is for the business tax system project. Uh, where it has changed from red to gray. 
Um, the gray status is a new color that we've added, and uh, that really just refers to if a project is put on hold for um, you know, just, justified reason. And so I will be providing uh, some details as what are some immediate next steps, particularly for that project and also the other projects um, that are a red status as well for the month of April. So on this slide, the, the, the main purpose of this is really to just show our performance measure for overall how we're doing with all our projects. And this also gives us a perspective as to how we can better help our departments be successful in the areas that matter uh, of more importance. Uh, and also uh, makes us aware of the progress and uh, take actions necessary so that we can minimize any uh, surprises. So at the moment, minimal changes happen since the, Mar uh, since the month of March. Um, uh, but you know, there is something that what we're learning, some of these projects are contingent upon support that we need through the procurement process or uh, through specialized um, uh, type of um, uh, expertises in order to move these projects forward. So, so this has been really fruitful for us to really highlight those uh, um, issues and address those roadblocks as soon as possible. So what you see there based on the status today for, uh, for this month of April, uh, 18 projects still remain um, of, uh, in green is 47%. 12 projects uh, are in yellow, that's 32%. And then uh, one, um, the seven projects are 18% in that one project that's gray, that's put on hold as 3%. So in the next slides, uh, we're gonna keep this pattern of just uh, showing uh, what we've sh uh, stated in the past as with regards to uh, the issues and the resolutions just for uh, reference, but then what I will be focusing on in the future is the next steps that we plan to take each month in order to get these projects back on stuff. So right now with the integrated permitting system, uh, so what uh, this project is still on track. Uh, it will be presented to the ad hoc committee for the Housing Construction and Development Services uh, Committee at the end of this month. And then once uh, they present their findings with this project, they will report back uh, to this committee and then we can uh, discuss what their next steps are. My San Jose. So there is one new issue that did occur uh, last month, and that was uh, one of the key personnel who was part of that uh, project uh, departed from the city. And um, again, this was referring to the special expertise that we need um, to move these projects forward. However, the, the, for this month, the action items that we uh, are ded uh, dedicated to move forward with is issue a change order to work with the consultant that's been uh, helping with this project, AST, uh, to continue to provide uh, the support and development of the app. Um, also, IT has been uh, supportive in adding um, you know, additional support and uh, to, uh, to do the release for the 1.7. And then also, we, the team is really gonna reevaluate the project approach and schedule based on the hiring and procurement requirements needed. And then also, uh, we are starting the process for a new project manager for, uh, to support with the technical side. So the data strategy, uh, we have been very successful in uh, finding candidates through the FUSE Fellow Program and fresh off the press, we have uh, selected a Chief Data off, uh, Fellow, sorry, I should say Chief Data Fellow. His name is Srinivas Up uh, Upaluri and uh, he will be starting on May 6th, but he, uh, since our committee is on May 2nd, we'll uh, beam him in, maybe part of our info infotainment. So, and I, I believe Dolan wanted to add uh, some additional information about the Bloomberg. Um, yeah, yeah. Th thanks, Reginie. Sure. Um, the uh, one of the major drivers of the chief data officer is to work on our Bloomberg certification criteria. One of the priorities that uh, Mayor Licardo and Dave Sykes, City Manager Dave Sykes, agreed to is for the city to achieve uh, Bloomberg certification. And when you achieve Bloomberg certification. Uh, it means up to $5 million a year in grants to help community benefit. Currently, we've received over $2 million for our Climate Smart program to help prove, uh, improve uh, our carbon uh, emissions and become aligned with, um, with uh, the, the Paris Accords. So that will be a major driver of this Chief Data Officer Fellow work because as Bloomberg evaluated us, most of our areas for improvement were not surprisingly in the data area. Thanks, Dylan. 
So the, our next one is the IT infrastructure modernization project. So we have been working very closely with the purchasing division to finalize a contract so that the project team can move forward in uh, starting it. And then also keeping in t uh, collaboration with the, RF, uh, the vendors who've been selected for the RFP so that they can still um, maintain the discounts and um, also the project team is available. And then they will, uh, once that's all finalized, uh, they'll do the kickoff um, as soon as the contract's signed. So with regards to the advanced cybersecurity RFP policy, uh, IT, IT and finance purchasing group have been working closely in order to finalize this RFP and hope to uh, release that this April. And then also they have been, um, they have uh, completed the policy and uh, will uh, get that all signed off with the auditor's office and then also OED, uh, OER, sorry, not OED, uh, for final adoption and signature. So access east side, uh, that's the last of the seven projects that are red status. And uh, so we are continuing to work with the Silicon Valley Talent Partnership and the PayPal team to uh, continue to do their evaluation of the Wi-Fi uh, network. Um, and then also uh, James Lick High School just recently provided us some educational outcome report effort, uh, that they've done uh, actually for the past five years. Uh, they've been analyzing certain measures, and so the city has been uh, reviewing that, and Jill Bourne is involved in that effort. Um, and then also uh, in, within the month, uh, the city will be meeting with the Eastside Union High School District to discuss next steps. So the project that, uh, that I identified earlier that was of gray status was the bu business tax system. Sorry, um, got excited here, okay. Uh, so uh, this one is uh, put on hold uh, primarily so that the team could focus on the business tax amnesty project. And once that is completed, they will, um, you know, they want, it, well actually not necessarily once that's completed during this month of April, they're going to uh, at least reflect and memorialize some of the next um, things that lessons learned from the RFP that was issued for the business tax system project. and see how they th use that to implement for the, the new RFP later on um, in Q1 of 2020. And then they will go with a recommendation to council in uh, later on in the fall of 2020. So, so in addition to the 38 high priority projects that were identified on the Smart City Roadmap, we're monitoring uh, the projects, the progress of the initiating projects that um, that were presented to the committee back in February. And then also there were a few projects that were recently added by the department um, that they recognize that these are future projects that need to be addressed on the roadmap. And so overall, there's a total of 13 that um, are gonna be, they're not quite ready yet to be on the roadmap. And really for them to graduate, technically, for them to, uh, to start being tracked and monitored, uh, they, they definitely need to have an approved budget, a dedicated team of staff, and then if required, a contract which that will define a scope of work and a schedule. So these are the criteria. So, but some of these have been moving forward and you know, so we will keep, that po keep the committee per, um, um, up to date. And then also um, what, what we do intend to do is by August, we will refresh the, the roadmap that you saw earlier in the presentation with these uh, new projects that will be added to the 38 that are currently going on. So, so the last part of the Smart City Roadmap um, is our small wonders. And uh, it, we are evolving this format, so it's very similar to our high priority Big Rocks projects. Uh, just, and uh, it, what has been really helpful is to recognize areas where we can um, you know, deliver projects that are small uh, time box and have a quick result. So, so we will be continuing to evolve this. Uh, we're working closely with the Mayor's Office of um, uh, Innovation and Technology as well. So, um, sorry, Technology and Innovation. And are working um, to see how we can make this more challenged base. And so we'll keep you posted as we move forward. Um, so in the interim, uh, these projects are currently in execution. And you will be hearing one of our highlighted stories, uh, which is one of the Startup and Residence Program. Uh, project, which is a street banner online reservation and asset management platform project. So before I give Sal the mic, I, I wanted to share a little background to the committee about what is Startup in Residence. And uh, the program is currently, it, the, the manage, uh, is managed by City Innovate, 
Um, and Jay Nath is uh, the co-executive um, who is unfortunately could not be here today, but I do want to recognize in the audience uh, Leah uh, Wiggs, who is the S uh, Startup in Residence uh, Program Director. So it was really kind of her to come down from San Francisco. And uh, she's been instrumental in helping these teams uh, really be successful in delivering their projects and also helping me out tremendously. So, uh, so overall, the uh, STIR program, uh, the intent is really to connect governments with startups and how they can solve civic uh, challenges through the use of technology and also with process improvements. And uh, what has been instrumental and beneficial for the city um, through the STIR program is really how can we enhance our demonstration policy. Um, uh, really it helped us kind of formulate a, um, a turnkey solution where we can help expedite the procurement process um, and where we can take an idea and demonstrate it for free. And it, if the proof of concept works, then we can go into a contract. And so this has been a really great opportunity for us to really vet out that idea. So San Jose is one of 22 cohorts of the 2019 STIR program. And so we are currently working on four challenges that you see there. So the housing department has um, initiated, and you hopefully you'll get to hear their great story. It's the affordable housing compliance system. Public works department is working on a compliance management tool, which really works on uh, a lot of the labor compliance requirements that are needed. Um, and then also the Office of Emerging, Emergency uh, Management and Housing, uh, they're developing a disaster response platform, which I hope in June uh, you guys will be able to hear that story. Um, very fascinating. And then last but not least, our Office of Ec Economic Development, which, is, which you will hear, is the online street banner, asset management and booking system. So without further ado, I'm going to turn the mic to Sal. And Apu, who is the lonely gentleman out there in the back of us, so uh, I'll give it away and they'll tell their story. Thank you. Thank you, Reginie. <clears throat> um, my name is Sal Alvarez. I'm with uh, the Office of Economic Development. Um, I manage the Our Streetlight Banner Program citywide. Next slide. And I'm um, also pleased to be here to share our story um, along with Apu Kumar from a lot of data. Um, so basically, uh, we have about a thousand streetlight pole banner hardware place, sets in place throughout the city. Um, most, you're mostly familiar probably with those that are in downtown, um, which the, the photo uh, features. Um, and I receive about between 25 and 30 applications a year. So every other week I'm probably touching some type of application for banners. They, tip, they typically come in, in, in bunches because we have seasons for banners as well. Um, and so we actually have one DOT staff person who actually goes and installs and removes anywhere between 1,700 and 2,000 banners a year. Um, and for campaigns that are as small as 18 to as large as 300 plus banners. And what we're seeing is um, we have a, community, a continued demand and interest in the banner program. So we're actually um, getting more requests through um, the San Jose Beautiful Grant Program where community groups are saying, we want to banner or highlight our, our community. Um, so Berryessa, for example, is one of those groups that has requested banners out. Um, in your district. Um, also, we're looking at Evergreen right now. Um, we've done some in, in downtown as well, like in the Lake House district. Um, and uh, what I found, given banners are this, you know, ubiquitous sort of uh, infrastructure in every city, um, there's no off-the-shelf solution to help manage banner requests and, and demands to reserve and those sorts of things. And so um, that's what sort of brought me to, um, to thinking about STIR as a pot potential option for, for me to develop a solution. So um, this is particularly my challenge. So I typically have just paper. So our, our system is basically completely paper driven. We have to download a PDF, 37 page PDF. Um, for this, for example, is the Apple Worldwide Developers Conference application. So Apple had to go through by hand, mark up maps. Um, the maps aren't always accurate. We have to go through and fix them. Um, and so, um, and then imagine Apple, Sharks, Baname, Clio, all these banners coming in all at the same time and season trying to figure out who gets what locations. Um, and so um, and we're also um, trying to figure out as well is given all of our, our banner hardware are on streetlight poles, we also have um, the telecom small cell deployment that is, you know, is likely to impact our program as well. And so we're trying to navigate those as well. So um, right now an applicant who's a returning applicant like say Fanime or the Sharks can reserve locations uh, two or three years in advance. Um, there's no requirement for deposit at this point in time, so 
you know, um, they're reserving uh, without a deposit. Um, the current fees that we charge are strictly for DOT staff time for installation and removal. It's not based on the duration for how long the banners are up. So if your banner's up for a week, you pay the same as someone who has their banner up for a month. Right now, there's no application fee. Um, so my time of, that I spend to go through and review, coordinate, um, there's, there's no capture for that. Um, and then also our invoices are still paid based basically via mail and check. So um, uh, anyways, and then, um, so I know that DOT and D Public Works have been rolling out on ArcGIS platform, and we actually, DOT staff actually attempted to try to create something in that platform for us. It's just not designed to do the multiple different uh, tricky things, uh, times, locations, um, interface, you know, with public. It's really mainly a, a staff tool for, for us to, to manage our assets. And so really what we're looking forward to is really a modernization of our banner management program. And really what we're looking to do is create better clarity for our applicants and then operational efficiency for staff. Um, and so really um, it's going to help us allow um, applicants to see reservations and staff in real time. Um, we'll provide an option for point of sale um, for um, a portal so that we can actually collect payments electronically. Um, one thing I'm excited about is being able to track and see which you know, which locations are, are being used the most so we can figure out are they in the right places in our city and, and deploy them uh, more efficiently. Um, and then we're getting more and more questions from more sort of sophisticated applicants asking for how many impressions did my banner have or evaluating whether we want to use this, this system in, in, the, in the future for our, our convention or our event or whatever. And so right now we're basically using the hose on the street, average daily traffic count, DOT data to kind of figure out how many people possibly might have seen their, their, their banners. Um, and then really what we're, I'm also excited about in the Office of Economic Development is really using the data for impressions and dwell time to get a better understanding of the value of our, of our infrastructure that we have in the right of way. So the process has been really actually um, super easy. I'm very, very excited to have Apu Kumar and, and a lot of data on the team. Um, and so really the goal for STIR is to develop a minimum viable product or MVP um, within a 16 week period where basically um, we have a, a, a a proof of concept um, where they're developing this time for free, something that we can then enter in contract to and secure and go forward and, and further develop um, the product. Um, and so Apu um, led us in a really great whiteboarding exercise to help me sort of understand all the different various workflows um, that I touched um, throughout the city in different departments. Um, I'm not one workflow, there's multiple workflows that we do and so, so helping, having him help me think through that has been very helpful. Um, a lot of data came to us because they manage billboards around the world and they sort of thought of our, our banner programs as miniature billboards. Um, and so they have a, a platform that manages billboards so they thought it would be great to sort of scale up that platform to manage banners as well and offer a solution for, for municipal government. And then also um, really um, their uh, competency um, is really in, in GIS and leveraging GIS as an information tool. Um, lessons learned. Um, I was expecting to, to get a, a, a no from our finance department to see if we can actually use, cre use credit card you know, to collect payments and I, was, I learned very quickly that no, there's no problem with that. Um, and I also learned that the, the main challenge for other departments to do that is we have to have a, like a portal on our, our web page uh, for the department to actually they can go click and say pay here. And so I think you know, that might be something we need to consider in building in our web payment infrastructure that allows for those kinds of things for departments to move into that, into that platform to allow for payment that way. Um, some other departments do it, um, and so um, that, that was really the main hurdle is just having it on our website. Um, also, um, again, sort of re re reaffirm that our, our banner program is highly valued, um, but not just by our partners, um, but also by the city because it generates revenue for all of us. Um, and then um, as we're mo moving, and working closely with the small cell team, um, we're learning that we're going to need to coordinate much more closely as their um, devices go on street light poles and how that might impact our banner program. Um, and then really, um, it's, it's of utmost importance to create the transparency for scheduling our banners so we can better, better provide customer service. So right now, a customer says what's available and they have to ask me, ask for the world, these are what we want, and then I have to sort through whether those are overlapping requests versus then be able to see and request what's actually available in real time online. Um, and then um, what we're going to be able to use with this platform is automated email messages that can either remind applicants to drop 
things off at the, at the south yard, or even um, as we tag poles that have the uh, small cell infrastructure devices on them, we can then also trigger an automated response to the telecom providers saying this pole is being reserved for a banner and, and it may be shut off in the next 15 days or whatever it is our requirement is to notify them. So we can do that in, a, in an automated way. Um, and then also um, by using uh, the cellular geotemporal data, we're going to be able to see and get a better sense of how many people are actually moving about in our, in our city. Um, again, the overlap between why the cell phone companies want to be on our poles that probably also have the banners is because we have the most people around them looking at them, um, and that's where the people are. And so um, this will also help us to figure out and prioritize how we allocate those resources of banner hardware throughout the city. We have lots of locations that aren't reserved at all, ever, and, um, and this will help us answer the question why, really. And then um, I'm going to introduce Apu Kumar, um, who's going to give um, our product demonstration so far of, of the progress we've made um, in developing this platform. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Apu Kumar, and I'm the CEO of Lot of Data. Uh, we are a tech company uh, with a civic bent, and it's an absolute pleasure and honor to be in front of you today. Uh, we've created a platform called uh, City Dash, uh, and we provide cities with data insights and a real-world uh, knowledge graph. And built into City Dash are uh, tools and services that cities can use for economic development, uh, urban planning, crime impact, uh, 311 impact, and of course, uh, banners and billboards. So we are thrilled that uh, San Jose has decided to work with us for managing and monetizing streetlight banners. And so let's jump right in and show you how this thing works and, and all the cool stuff we've been doing with Sal and Rajni and Alvina. So City Dash is an online platform. It's 100% cloud-based. And you can access it through our website, citydash.ai. Um, Sal already has an account on the platform. Uh, every city user, every customer user would have an account on the platform. So that makes it very easy to sign into City Dash directly uh, through your browser. So when you sign in, you arrive at the map of San Jose. The colors represent the people density in different parts of the city. Uh, you would have access to all your banners. So in this case, Sal has access to over 1,000 banners and billboard locations right here uh, on the map in City Dash. The bright green circles, uh, they represent, as you zoom into the map, they represent the streetlight pole locations that you could attach banners to. The platform is interactive. So you can explore the banner locations directly on the map. You can search through the inventory of available locations. You can just type in a street name or an intersection name or, or even a, a venue name to, to find the banners that are relevant to those locations. The tool brings back the list of banners, also the dimensions for the banners at each location. And, and also how they relate to the different things on the map, like building structures, parks, and roadways. You can explore all the creatives and the campaigns. So campaigns that are currently active in the platform, you can search by organizations like NHL, San Jose Quakes, Saster. Uh, you can also view the creatives that are linked to these campaigns and search by sponsors. So uh, Miller Coors, Honda, SAP, Ticketmaster, and so on. Creating a new Streetlight Banners campaign is, is, a, is a really simple, straightforward four-step process. So you would uh, set your company, your campaign name. Uh, you would then select the organization. In most cases, that would be auto-defined. Add a short comment about what this campaign is. And then you would select the dates uh, for your campaign. So for this test campaign, we are going 22nd through the 20, 26th. The, this filters the street lights based on the dates and only displays the polls that are available for that campaign. So now if you want to select locations near the SAP Center, you can type that in and um, that will bring up the polls near SAP Center. As you select the polls uh, on the map and you're adding them to the campaign, they turn yellow on the map so you know exactly where your campaign is going to run. Step three would require you to associate a creative with your campaign, so that's easy to do. And the final step is to pay a deposit to reserve the campaign. The total cost for your campaign is automatically calculated based on the number of polls, and a 10% deposit can be paid um, online with a credit card. And just like that, 
you have a new campaign in the system. Uh, of course, the campaign needs to be approved. Uh, the, the creative needs to be validated. So all of those steps uh, need to happen. These happen offline. And then email alerts are sent out to the, the users. So now you could potentially have hundreds of campaigns running on the streetlight polls uh, throughout the city. But how many people really passed by these polls and, and potentially saw these banners? So that's where campaign analytics comes in. You can zoom in to view the banner locations and click on the surrounding area, and we can tell you a quick count of the people in that area by day of week and also by hour of day. So this data is completely anonymized, aggregated privacy compliant, uh, and such deep data analytics uh, will help the city to establish value of these streetlight banners, understand which banners in, in which neighborhoods offer higher visibility, and potentially charge a premium for such banners. Um, this also helps to bring in new customers into the platform and, and grow the overall banners program. So I hope you liked the demo of City Dash for San Jose. We, we love working on projects that are impactful and provide an instant return on investment. Um, San Jose Streetlight Banners Project is exactly that. And thank you for the opportunity again. Great, uh, thanks. Just, and just to clo close that off, I know we combined kind of two topics, uh, the roadmap uh, stoplight status report, which is always thrilling and exciting with uh, an actual demonstration. Uh, and with the mayor coming in late, I also think it's important to remind that this was part of our startup and resident small wonder project, one of the small wonders that the quiz that uh, Council Member Davis won uh, earlier today. Um, so for an enrollment fee of basically $50,000 into the STIR fund, this is one of four projects. So all the value that you just saw on the board and, and that Sal is able to get, both for the operational efficiency of his department, not having to manually process 73 page, thousands of 73 page applications, and the value to our business partners of having an online portal, portal now that basically averaged you know, a cost of $12,000 of, 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 of what we, the value that we got for, for, the, for this demonstration. Um, and that's just one of four projects that from the STIR program, the Small Wonders projects that you'll continue to see throughout the, the next, um, at least in June, we're gonna be coming back with one as well. So, so with that, we'll turn it back to Chair Diep for questions about the roadmap or about the street, the small wonder street right. light banner program. Thank you. Seeing um, no public comment, other questions? Uh, go ahead, Councilmember Davis. Thank you for the presentation of the demonstration. Um, one question about that: When we go to electronic billboards, will this, will we use the same platform to manage that for our public? billboard spaces that we're looking at doing? So at this point in time, um, our agreement right now is really to develop a platform just to manage our banner program, but that's something that we could consider and we'll have to figure out how we would do that from a procurement perspective. The digital billboards is going gonna, is gonna to be, uh, is going to require an RFP for operation and maintenance of the electronic billboard, so that will have to have a whole new process. The, the consultant will be able to bid into that if they are able to do such a process, but the RFP will describe exactly what we will need for digital uh, billboards, um, but it's not related to the banner project. Okay, but the management of reserving the space and the time, will that be on, will, will we have like an omnibus R RFP? Because there's, there's the physical maintenance of the, of, the of the digital billboards, but this is content very similar to mm -hmm. the banners, which is, I assume, why a lot of data was willing to to add in. This yeah, there is a little bit. There is a, there is a function. slight difference between the banners and the digital signs. The banners are more for city events. It's not open to uh, advertising for third parties just to advertise. There are sponsors that are identified in some of the banners, but the banners are more for city events, and so there is a limited use of those banners as opposed to the advertising which is going to be primarily off-site advertising for a variety of reasons. So the process for the digital signs has not been done yet. They're still in the process. Uh, OED is still in the process of determining how they want that handled. Um, and so that's going to be a separate process from the banners. Even though they may be similar, it, it, it will not really be for the, it, they don't uh, serve the same purpose. 
I understand that they don't serve the same purpose. Sal, do you think that this is a sensible expansion of, of this project? Because I don't know how you're expecting to manage the content for those, for those billboards. And so as, as uh, Mr. Moran mentioned, um, so, so there's gonna be the basically pure offsite advertising of the public, bill, public billboards, um, which um, we may decide to work with um, a vendor that manages them through our platform. Um, that's something that we haven't, that hasn't been determined yet. We're still beta testing and Oh, so we're expecting to have a vendor to manage the content. So that's the RFP that's, that's actually what I didn't being understand. developed. Thank you. And so how we, so how we did, how we use our platform to help us think about our electronic billboards um, hasn't been determined yet either. So, so part of what's exciting to me about this is the city having more understanding of how many views are actually happening on our public infrastructure and how we're able to interpret the value of that infrastructure and how we interact with um, those vendors that are actually making revenue off of our, off of our infrastructure. Right. And, and I think um, uh, looking at this from a business friendly perspective, regardless of what we do, it won't prevent someone from partnering with someone who has a solution in this space. So I think the city's investment you know, uh, certainly is, has the opportunity to pay off multiple fold beyond just this project. Right, thank you. And I, I just see that the potential to coordinate those activities because when CFP was here, for example, they, they had banners, but if we had had digital billboards, they would also be using that. And I, I can imagine the same would be true of you know, when Facebook comes or Apple comes, that they would also want to be using that, the digital billboards. And so it would make sense if there was some ability to coordinate that and kind of do it as a package. Um, that's all I had for the, the demonstration. I have a higher level question about the, the roadmap. Um, if, I, I don't remember if last time, was my San Jose red last time? Um, no, it was not. Okay, and so it would be helpful of the... Oh, I, I, I'm sorry, I was thinking the website. Yes, my San Jose was read last time as well. Okay, so it would be helpful just as a reminder for us which ones have changed color over mm -hmm. time, and I don't remember seeing that. But that's what I was noticed. Uh, I identified the business tax uh, system project was the only one that changed this time. Okay. So yeah, sorry, so I, I will. You no, that. no worries. Uh, yeah, because we wanted to have a reference point where what we showed in March, and we'll yeah. just use that as the baseline. And I will point that out in our Thank presentation. You. Yeah, sure. And the the um, the business tax system. So it's on hold now. It was at risk before, and they basically just decided not to go forward with the current because there was a yeah i think i think at this point um what would be best is to have uh lisa? julia lisa excuse me lisa come down and address that question i didn't know it had been put on hold until yeah. just now lisa so that's why i'm a little bit surprised yeah um lisa titano assistant director of finance um why we had asked it was read and uh, red status said that, um, uh, what is the term at the bottom of the? Corrective action, I think. Corrective, corrective action. action. So we did take corrective actions on the project. So as opposed to having it read for another two years and reminding uh, the committee that we've taken the corrective action, we wanted it to have its own um, special status of on hold. Okay, and so um, the last I remember hearing is there was some issue with the, the contractor, and so it looks like we have to go out to a new RFP completely. So we that, have severed ties with the current contractor. That's correct, and that's why the, it's a, a two-year um, window because we're also, we've moved over the same resources that we're working on, the BTS implementation are now working on our business tax amnesty program, and then we will issue the RFP and when we can go back to the green, yellow, or red status here, we have to have a plan. Mm -hmm. So I figured that we'd have to have already done the RFP and procured a new vendor, and then we can um, provide green status, hopefully. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. And, and Council Member um, Davis, I think, first of all, the roadmap's doing its job because you asked that question. 
the second was if you remember last time when this committee took place we were legally bound not to have that discussion and we've passed that transition now so now we can have that discussion which is why it hadn't changed status other than it was is read and now it's it's on hold and we can publicly discuss that thank you uh, vice mayor jones first of all i want to protest the uh the quiz that we had earlier when i saw the diamond i was thinking big bling so just like the sat i think that the, your uh, your quiz was uh culturally biased so i just want to i just want to well, i want to follow i want to i want to follow protests on that uh, in, in, in it, oh, i'm sorry oh so anyway um i also want to uh com commend you uh, in terms of the um, red status detail, uh, really it, it answered a lot of the questions that I was going to have. So thank you for having it in there. It's almost like you were anticipating, you've been with us so long that you've been, been you're able to anticipate a lot of the questions that we would have. The only um, upgrade that I would have to that, uh, that detail report is action items, um, maybe even just further action items beyond April if, you know, these items, which are probably going to go come back to this committee, if we can have some type of information about when they're going to come back to the committee and in a little bit more detail in terms of uh, the actions that this committee would have to take on those items. That, that's great, and we'll be happy to do that. We actually have a, a detailed action item log that you probably don't want to be exposed to, but we'll come back with more specific actions and dates for the committee. Great. Fantastic. That's all the input I had. Mayor Licardo? Thanks. Uh, really appreciated the demonstration on the small wonder. I think it's fantastic. Uh, I had a couple just uh, questions in the weeds on that. One is, do we have dynamic pricing for these polls? So at this point in time, we don't have dynamic pricing. They, we pay basically a flat fee for yeah. just the cost of installation um, for our DOT staff to install and remove the banners. So the software should allow for that, right, during sort of the peak desired times in the holidays or whatever. I mean, we should... I mean, does it have the functionality for us to be able to insert that? So, and so that's actually um, where a lot of data, how they, how, how they manage billboards. Um, and I mean, Apu could, could comment on that further. Yeah. Um, but generally, um, it's how many people see a billboard, for example, in a period of time. Right. It helps drive the cost of, of what the, the, the person pays the, the vendor for, the, for at the billboard. Uh, right. And so right, right now, we're, we're quite not at that step, but we do know that um, more and more uh, applicants are ha have sponsors on their banners. Um, so there's definitely a value to actually having our ban banners. And so, um, and there's no, you know, there's no premium that they would have them for up to maybe one week or two weeks or three weeks or four weeks. And so that's something that those are things that we need to consider and figure out how we would implement through our fee structure. Okay. But the software has a functionality for us to be able to move all that around. Um, yes, the software allows for that. That's and great. so you can, you can dynamically allocate pricing based on uh, the number of people in that area, uh, so potential real-world yeah. impressions, as well as peak season. That's great. Because uh, I, I think both about revenue generation as well as determining who gets to be a winner or a loser when everybody wants the same poll at the same time. And I imagine location also has tremendous impact on desirability, and so we may want to price that in as well. And um, so I think that's great. I, I have How long, uh, forgive me, because I know I came in late, uh, has this been up very long? So we're actually in the process of developing this this platform. Okay. So this is we're right now in testing mode. Right. Um, and so we hope to actually have it um, out testing with um, most likely folks from Team San Jose, right. um, some internal partners that w w use it regularly um, to awesome. give us sort of you know their impressions of how us how user friendly it is and and uh, that transition. They're one of the folks who've asked for actually credit card payment um, the most because sure. they use it the most and and um, the check thing is. Um, presents challenges. Sometimes. That's great. Well, I'm glad we're listening to folks who have the interface with the customer. That's great. And, I, you know, I just think this really demonstrates how important these small wonders are. Uh, you know, this could be a significant revenue generator, maybe not tens of millions, but certainly, you know, we could generate dollars here. And in the tough times, that's going to matter a lot to us. It always matters to us, uh, given our challenges budgetarily. So I think this is wonderful and um, really look forward to seeing it up and running. Um, I had a question about the process itself for sort of identifying small wonders because it appears it's sort of driven by individual departments at this point. Is that, is that fair to say? 
Right now, uh, that's been uh, how we've been getting some of these ideas specifically for the Startup in Residence program that they, they've surfaced up from various departments. Is there uh, any ability for you guys in the CMO to sort of drive selection and maybe even by, you know, by technology to some extent? I mean, I, I wonder to what extent we're really taking advantage of the locational advantage we have here in Silicon Valley. Um, you know, I know that if everybody's in their silo, they're going to think about the problem of the day and how to fix that. But I know you guys are interacting in a broader um, ecosystem where you can actually identify not just how to fix this problem, but how to um, solve the problems of the future and actually create, take advantage of opportunities that maybe somebody who's not thinking about at their desk. And so I, I just hate to think that all this is going to be driven by whoever's trying to fix whatever's broken at the moment, as opposed to something that really could drive us more significantly to the future. And I'm just wondering if there's room for that. The, there, yeah, there is, Mayor. So I think there's there's two ways we're going to do that. Um, first of all, we, we wanted this is the first time the city has been engaged in, in STIR. So this was kind of a iterate to improve. So we we went in with these four projects, and we can certainly scale that. Um, but we wanted to see how it worked. Uh, the second point is is that we we as part of the budget conversation we had we introduced the concept of a small wonders pipeline manager. Um, so right right now, as you can imagine, we just increased the number of big rocks by 30 percent based on those ones that are initiating. Right. Um, so it's going to be hard for Regine to track 51 projects, more or less 38. Uh, so I think we we're hoping that that small wonders pipeline manager makes it through. The, uh, the budget conversation, it, it it's, was not in the budget presented to you. I was able to say that. Uh, oh, okay. So, so that's one that's one thing we need to no. address. Uh, then I think the second- Effective would, lobbying job. Yeah, 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 right. Uh, <laughs> for, for discussions with Margaret McCahan, Kip, I'm, I'm okay to, to bring that to, uh, uh, as part of the conversation. Uh, and, and then also, uh, we'll be able to leverage actually the STIR program. There's 22 other cities participating in STIR. So we're going to be able to leverage an ecosystem. Hopefully, we'll get resources to better think strategically with the departments about how to align these things together. Okay. And hopefully, we'll get the resource to be able to do that. I think as the departments see, I mean, you can see Sal's excitement. This is like Sal looking yeah. excited. You see Sal's excitement. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think as, as we promote these, not only here to the committee, but internally to the other departments about the success or with, with basically a $12,000 investment, we're going to get you know, the ability to scale a solution like this um, uh, uh, moving forward, I think the departments will see more value. So the, that's a long answer to yes. Okay, I think I get it, and I understood about the small wonder. I mean, I think that job managing small wonders could be the best job in the city in terms of the ability to, to take on really cool new projects. So, yeah, I look forward to seeing how we can support it. Uh, Councilmember Jimenez. I, I found it fascinating. Uh, I do have a few questions. One about the permitting system. One, one of the reasons it stands out is we recently got an update about uh, outstanding audit items and such. A uh, permitting system was, was in there. Um, so I think it was uh, slide seven. If you can go to slide seven. I think there's a two-year delay. And, and the, 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 the component, the, the section of concern for me was, or maybe it wasn't slide seven. If you can go up a little bit. The one where, where it talked about permitting system and it shows some of the, where it shows all the way up to April, if that makes sense. There you go. So it said delayed by over two years. And, and so the, the, what concerns me is lack of coordination across several siloed teams. And I know it says internal and external. What I found is some of the challenges we have at the city are oftentimes because departments are not talking. And so what I was curious about, I have two questions. One of them is how much of the two years is attributed to that particular lack of coordination? Um, and, and, and how much is that internal as opposed to external, which we don't know is we can't control? Kim Harkness, Deputy City Manager, um, and just happened to be late coming from an executive team meeting, <laughs> focusing on just exactly this issue. The good news is we do now have a governance structure in place that brings all of those departments together and allows them to collaborate at the executive level and then at the individual team level and provides clarity on who gets to make the decisions and move forward. Because essentially what we'd had is uh, a system where 
each department or department head was advocating for what made sense from their perspective, but there wasn't really clarity if those, those conflicted. And so there is now, and so if, I, if we look back, we actually brought in Gartner to help us do a retrospective, a help check on that project, which is what led us to the reset. And I'd be happy to provide that, that Gartner documentation to you. But the, the, the blame was on both sides of the equation, both on the contractor side and on the internal side. I would say that a significant amount of the delay was our inability to make clear, crisp decisions and then to stick with those decisions in a focused way. So I think we bear a fair amount of responsibility and we, over the last three months, have taken a serious steps to remedy that, but I, it, it, you're correct that it is the cross-departmental collaboration in this case which is one of the key factors getting in our own way on moving forward on that. Thank you. Th does this fall into any of the enterprise priorities of the city manager? It, it does. I think it's the fifth one that sort of de development services and building the future of San Jose. It has two parts to it. Mm -hmm. One are the big projects, um, some of the individual big projects like the towers going up downtown. The other is the back end, if you will, of it, of the systems piece. Kim Wallace is on the front end side uh, with the projects, and then I'm the executive sponsor on sort of the back end, which is really replatforming our technology, but also making sure that we are are retraining the people and putting them on top of good processes when we do that. Mm -hmm. and, and is there any, you know, because I've, I've heard of obviously the enterprise priorities is something that's being, I think rightfully so touted as a good way for departments to really work uh, together uh, in a very cohesive manner. And, and so I, I hope that things are moving in a positive direction, but does the city manager's office have anything in place to evaluate sort of how that's going? Interestingly, this, just this morning, uh, the city manager conducted two readouts on uh, on the enterprise priorities. He does a regular uh, review on each of them, and each of them is expected to develop a set of, uh, in our case, we have objectives and measurable key results that we report out to, which will be the same ones for the development services that we report out to the development services committee in April. And so what he's done is create uh, an operating cadence where each of the uh, department teams that are responsible for that are doing a readout to him. At this point, it's every kind of every two months, so that he keeps on tab on those eight priorities which he's outlined, everything from powered by people to the uh, fiscal positioning to the emergency management ones. Okay. All right. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. Uh, the, the other question I had was around my San Jose app. I, I think that's, uh, we're trying to move everyone to reporting online, and so this app, <laughs> I think, is vitally important to that, and I, and I think we are not really capturing the need uh, of the residents out there as, as, the, as many of them, quite frankly, can't read the app because they don't, you know, they speak Spanish, they only read uh, Vietnamese and such. And so, and so the development of this and moving it forward is very important to me. And so what I'm curious about, one, two things that st stood out to me is, have we considered using a Fuse Fellow to move this along or, or the startup and residents? I'm not sure if those are, co you know, if those would work well to try to move this along, but uh, I'm just curious as to how the, these existing programs can be used to, to move that at a, at a, at a greater speed. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take the first intercept of that on My San Jose. So My San Jose 2.0, uh, the scope of that is to include multilingual support. Cool. Um, understand that we have a significant procurement backlog and that's really the, the root cause of the delay right now with My San Jose 2.0 is we have other projects like cybersecurity that place up to the top because if we don't get that done and implemented the impact to the city and the community could be huge. So unfortunately the My San Jose 2.0 uh, is in the backlog. It is not even being worked yet due to the procurement uh, backlog. So to your first question about not being able to read it, um, the multilingual support will be in My San Jose 2.0. That's a key requirement. Uh, in terms of uh, is that so def in terms of having startup and resident or refuse look at um, look at this as the next challenge. Yeah, I think that's a good idea we'll consider and, and circle back to. Okay. D does the fact that it's on the backlog sort of not rise to the, <laughs> to the level of someone that you would use or, or, or something that you would use Fuse Fellow or Stir's Stir person to, to work on? Or, I mean, is that highly unlikely, I guess, given the current sort of status of this and where it sits in the back? <laughs> I, I, I don't think so. I, honestly, I think because of where it is, um, we have to think through the procurement path with the startup and residents uh, and also with our Fuse fellows. We have a cycle and this is kind of out of, out of cycle with that. Um, 
however since it doesn't have an exit from the procurement process it could very well line up with our fall fuse fellowship schedule and we can definitely look at that and then just in the in the details for a moment i want to share some of the findings that michelle tongs team has come up with that i found were particularly interesting around language she actually had some of her team who are user experience experts nira and julie out and doing user research and rather than just speculating about how do people use or not use the tool based on multilingual, watching people use or not use the tool. They were out at the flea market and they spent several days out there having people interact with the actual tool and mock-ups. And one of the things they found is that, to their surprise, is that the design of the tool and the simplicity of the tool have as much of an impact on a non-English speaker's ability to use it as whether it's in their native language or not. So that you can actually get a tool that can be used by a primary Spanish speaker, a primary Vietnamese speaker, if your design is beautiful and elegant and you're using icons that are clear and buttons that make sense, and that the language in some cases is actually not insignificant, but secondary to the eloquence of the design. And so that Though some of those findings are already being incorporated in the current revisions just to try to make it more well designed so that regardless of what the language is, you don't actually have to read as much, you just interact with it. And you see this already on some of the best in class apps that are out there. There are not entirely language agnostic, but you're able to do them without necessarily having to go deep into, into language. The other thing we found about language is that plain English is really valuable. We often do jargon, we do acronyms, we have complicated ways of speaking, and whether or not you are a speaker of another language, simplifying the English dramatically increases the usability of the app. So those are two findings that we've found and we're already putting into practice in the 1.7 and 1.8, even before we get to 2.0. Yeah. Thank you, I, I appreciate that. I think that's valuable. Um, yeah, I, I guess one of my just underlying concerns, and I, I think you've sort of alleviated that to a certain extent, is what I wouldn't want to see is that this gets put in the back burner simply because it's just not a priority, right? Uh, and so I didn't know if it was just a matter of resources or exactly what it was, but I know it's, it's a complicated uh, challenge. Uh, and I'll leave you with this. So my team is in the process of scheduling a, what we call a, uh, Department of Transportation Town Hall. <laughs> and part of what we're going to get, and it's Spanish for Spanish speakers, and so what we're going to be doing is we're going to be showing folks how to use the My San Jose app, but we got we got to do it in English, and so I'm very much curious to see how, how that plays out given some of what you guys found at the, at the flea market. And if we, if we can help out and be there and learn from that experience and, and watch and listen to people, we'd be happy to do we'll that. We'll let you know. I, I appreciate that. It's a good idea. Thank you. Um, just driving home Mayor Licardo's point earlier, but I think uh, Dolan's response, but from that I got that, that your team is understaffed. Is that what I heard? Regine's understaffed? Regine's smiling. The bottom line would be yes. We're, you know, we, if we look at some of the impacts of cross-department coordination uh, and the, the need to manage these uh, big rocks and small wonders across multiple departments. It is a challenge for one person to, to do that in, in a timely and, and effective manner. So we, um, we did ask for, in the budget conversation, we have asked for an additional resource to take that more strategic view of the small wonders. What I think the mayor was getting to was, rather than a bottoms up department view, let's look at the top down view of, of our technology challenges and align that up with the small wonders projects. Uh, that, um, that that resource did not make it up in the latest uh, budget proposal. Oh, and, and so it's not on the budget for, uh, proposed budget coming up, but what's, Cor what's the line item? Uh, there's small wonders project manager. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, amount. Um, I believe it was allocated at approximately with loaded costs as, as an employee about um, 230. Okay, that seems... I mean, that seems a good return. Anyways, all right. Um, a good discussion for another day. Yes, all right. I, I will get into that. Uh, to our, uh, was it City Space? City, the, the app, the, the Stir Fellow, or was it called City? City Dash. City Dash. Oh, excuse me, City, City Dash. Dash. Um, with, with that software, it seems remarkably similar to me to what we had for the. Um, um, the small cells maps. Uh, would would we like if we're to adopt it and expand it? Be, but it seems like City Dash has more functionality than the, the demonstration we saw um, 
I mean, it's just, we saw five minutes of it, but from what I've seen, uh, it seems like it's more functional than what we saw a few, few meetings ago. Um, is, this, is there redundancy in this, or, or could we expand City Dash or one of the other to serve both purposes? Yeah, they were under different time frames and different sets of users, and so I, I think that the underlying data um, is actually uh, overlapping because in the small cell um, permitting application that you saw, we actually did have which light poles had banners on them. Mm -hmm. So there's some, so there's some data integration that, that's taking place or is gonna take place. Um, I think that uh, one of the things that Matt Lesh will be doing, who kind of leads the city's GIS, is, is rationalizing that. I think that based on the user space, we'll probably keep them separate, but we'll certainly try to maximize. But at the end of the day, they're both pointing to GIS data, mm -hmm. and we'll make sure that we maximize that and don't create two siloed applications but they um, they have different sets of users, and so we're going to integrate on the same data, so we don't have data redundancy, but we'll probably have two sets of applications still. And what you didn't see behind the behind the hood on the small cells is it's a much heavier weight permitting because of the electrical review, the structural review, mm -hmm. all of that that's necessary, versus the banners are not nearly as technically complex. Sure. And so, yeah, there is an overlap on the data, but at this point, it, at this point it makes sense to keep them as separate, though I think we should look at some point of, of learning from one to the other and see whether we can scale. Okay, uh, the user interface on this one seems, seems uh, pretty friendly. Um, I just had a question for the, the City Dash uh, representative. So in your presentation or your demo, um, you said you, somebody can look at um, how many people are walking by that area looking at the billboard or the, or the banner, um, and it almost seems like real time. So how, how does one capture that? Uh, it, is, it is lagging by about uh, 24 to 48 hours. So in, it's, it's not nearly real time. That data comes through um, a variety of sources. So we're looking at uh, perhaps Wi-Fi data, we might be looking at small cell data, we might be looking at mobile app data. And all of this is completely anonymized as in there is, um, there is no user information or customer information coming through. And it is anonymized, aggregated, clustered, and all you see is a heat map. So we essentially get a feel for the counts for people in a given area, and that's pretty much it. But it gives you a sense for how many people might be around a cluster of billboards or banners, um, or it could be uh, how many people are around a stadium or an arena. As it gives you a good feel for people presence, uh, people activity, people movement. Right, so basically, bring, walking around with my cell phone, I'm, I'm being, well, I'm not being tracked, but I'm giving a signal that, you know, I'm on the network, and so we know how many people are on a network or something, basically. Some such thing, yes. Right, okay, all right, thank you. Um, any further questions? If not, uh, can we get a motion to accept the report? Uh, all in favor? Aye. All right, that passes. The motion. And this. All right, we'll uh, move on to the next item. Um, techno IT strategic plan update. Yes, so uh, good afternoon, council and public again. Uh, Dolan Beckel here to, to introduce Rob Lloyd. Um, this committee back in 2017 approved the, uh, the uh, strategic plan for IT for the IT department, and they report back every year to share the progress on these efforts and where adjustments occurred and where priorities evolved. Um, the IT uh, roadmap is entering its last leg of a three-year cycle, and as some recall, the progression that the ID, this committee outlined for the IT department was basically to become brilliant at the basics after several decades of, of deficit in investment. Um, so becoming brilliant at the basics would allow us to succeed with important initiatives so that we could build upon that, uh, that platform and go from basic, brilliant IT to more innovative smart city projects. And so having said that, here to provide an update on the IT strategic plan and the IT audit, audit is the city's chief information officer, Rob Lloyd. Good afternoon, committee chair, mayor, uh, committee members and members of the public. Rob Lloyd, CIO for the city of San Jose. Um, we we're actually very excited to bring this to you. As, as um, Dolan mentioned, this is the entrance of the last leg of our three-year strategic plan that uh, council approved in 2017. 
Uh, and so it is the, the um, second to last where we left our IT heroes story. And it is the story of a lot of IT and partner work. So one of the de uh, defining aspects of everything around the IT strategic plan that you see is how much it crosses departmental lines and getting used to it and developing that acumen. So we're going to, as part of our plan today, review um, this item and, and give you a short history because of some new um, council members and for the public. Uh, we're going to cap with a summary of the goals and strategies that we set. And we're going to share with the committee our successes, our active items, and some lessons learned. Um, and then progress um, as the progress that we've uh, accomplished, share the, the product that so many contributors have been part of, and then um, take any questions and comments that you have. And so, to be clear, where we began with was a clear vision with Council. Um, council in 2016 said that technology should no longer be a cost um, function and a back office function, it should be a strategic asset. And that was to accomplish the goals, high level goals of being a user friendly city, a sustainable city, inclusive, safe, and also something unique to San Jose and, and part of um, Silicon Valley culture and DNA is an experimental um, piece where we should be able to try, learn, and, and as council and mayor have said, fail forward um, if we're going to fail. Uh, and those lessons that we have are applied to three, uh, three core approaches that we have for San Jose, which is throughout this journey, we're going to champion the customer, we're gonna learn through data, and we are gonna build ourselves to iterate to improve. And all that is going to be so that we can go on a journey from 2016 to 2020 that takes traditional government um, processes that are exhausting, bureaucratic, um, ignorant of, of, of kind of the experience of people to one that is built around customer experience, um, clean and agile processes, speed, and an engaged workforce. Uh, and so there are three components to what we've been talking with council and, and the committee about. Uh, and so you've heard the Smart Cities Roadmap, you've heard about the smart, uh, the small wonders, and then there's the IT strategic plan approach that, that council asked for and required of us in 2016 to complete. And, and to be clear, this is the focus on the IC, IT strategic plan portion of our work. Uh, for history, we did have a method to our madness um, and we had a very thorough um, process in terms of how we went about saying where are we with technology and marrying the anecdote and grounding it in reality and saying what are people's experience, what are their frustrations, what's the input that we would need, what are the resource pictures that we're gonna have to paint so we can create um, an image and a clear, clear mission for ourselves on what it's going to take to build that next IT organization that we asked for. And we also grounded that uh, around a couple realities. So we had frozen IT in the organization through the decade of deficits into circa 2006, 2007, and, and really had made no investments. Um, the audit report painted the same picture. In terms of staffing and funding, IT was one of the last two departments to still be at that deficit level. Um, the rest of the organization kind of had, had emerged out of that. The other thing we realized is um, from that point we saw three years ago or two and a half years ago is the picture for technology and the use of technology and the demands for both our public and our organization was changing drastically. So we are um, coming from this PC era into the mobile era and then we saw the IoT smart cities, the Internet of Things and smart cities era as a whole new uh, quantity and scale of problems and, and opportunities. And, and in the smart city vision, a council correctly called that out. Said this is the point in time where we have to make that bold investment and, and um, that very clear and concerted investment to be ready for what's possible ahead of us. But another way to say that is we were going to come roughly 13 years of progress in three years. In some ways that's an advantage because you have Greenfield. There, there was nothing to hold us back in certain spots. Um, in other spots there, there was really old stuff that in some ways was perversely secure because no one remembered what it was. Um, and, and, uh, but ultimately, it wasn't allowing us to, to have a cross-domain enabled environment that the city um, could say that it needs. Uh, another thing that we saw very clearly was the concept of tech debt. And um, IT, same as any other asset, is one that you have to invest in, right? So if it's, it's like a bridge. Um, if you neglect it long enough, sooner or later it fails. And we said there's a couple symptoms that we were seeing. We were seeing mounting audit findings of deficits. Uh, in our project management, we had zero uh, professional project managers and our large investments in IT in the organization were almost completely unsuccessful. Um, over about four years, almost four years, there was one instance where we said it hit its scope 
its schedule and its, its value and um, uh, to the department of, of all the investments that we made. So we were out of practice. The organization was showing that, it, that um, those transformative things that we were going to be doing were going to be an extra struggle because of where we were. And then we also saw that the, the resourcing picture for the city, um, our, our resourcing picture for IT as an organization of, of three plus billion dollars in the heart of Silicon Valley, a million residents, 80 plus thousand businesses, actually matched like Albuquerque, New Mexico and, um, and um, like Gresham, Oregon. So uh, when you took a look at what we were getting, we could be proud that we were getting a lot for the buck. Um, but in terms of investment, um, we, we could say that there was some ground to, to make. Um, and it boiled down to a few numbers, and we said, if we're going to paint the cleanest picture, what matters? Customer satisfaction matters first, because if you're doing a good job, your, your customers are going to say, we appreciate the service. We had a good number in 2016 at 74%, um, but we, we thought that was below what we could hit. Our project success rate in 20-plus 20, uh, 20 projects that had been inbe invested in in the previous almost four years, um, we had a less than 5% success rate with that. So we knew we weren't managing change very well. IT reliability should be 99.9% .9 and above. We were at 991 and heading down. Um, IT employee engagement uh, from the Gallup poll, question 12. Um, we're at the eighth percentile. That's not the eighth top. It was the eighth bottom. Um, so Gallup said that uh, we, we were at the, the lowest that they had seen, um, and we could have a, an opportunity to improve. Um, service, uh, service response, we said we were an eight to five IT shop when people rely on their technology 24 by seven. Um, the audit report um, painted the picture that IT budget should be about two to three percent, uh, two and a half, uh, I think was what they recommended of a city's budget. Um, and that was the investment in the catalyst of an organization. And we were at about 1.2 percent. Um, concerningly, 71 percent of our hardware was end of life, end of support over 10 years old, hardware and software. So we had hung on to, to wonderful systems that had done a great job for a long time, but not replaced them. And so we had accumulated a lot of tech debt in the sense that we have a lot of work to do to climb out of that. And then the last thing that council actually said specifically in my, even in my um, confirmation process was we had maintained an over 36% vacancy rate for over three years. And so when you're a lean team and you don't even have the, t uh, the people that you have positions for, um, can you really make progress? And so council set us the challenge appropriately, how do we fix that? We also had some strengths, though, and, and we want to say that across that um, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats model, um, if ever there was a city, and we said this back in 2016, 2017, that, that can climb out of that hole, it is San Jose. Um, because we had clear direction from council, we had a stable economy, uh, and still do. Um, we have technologies and partners that we can bank on, uh, and being in Silicon Valley, no one can tap um, industry like we can. Uh, we were very clear about our weaknesses, but we also said in terms of threats that there were new and bigger ones than we had ever seen before. For example, cyber disasters and th cyber threats, we predicted in 2016 and uh, 2017 that we would see a lot more. They would start penetrating into government. Um, you would start seeing some of our peers get hit, and, and sure enough, that's what we have seen over the last two years. We also said that we wanted IT to be an asset for the organization when the next downturn hit. Uh, because we, you cannot, in an economic downturn, um, fix the problem by throwing more people at it because we don't have the money for it. So people need tools. They need better processes. Uh, and so if technology is going to do its job, we were going to be ready for that next turn uh, and be able to help the organization when they needed us the most. So we set the strategies and direction um, and uh, the, the kind of stages that we talked about. We're brilliant at the basics, um, and that was really getting out of tech debt and getting core competencies and maturity in place. We then talked about how while we were doing that, there was going to be some opportunities that we could win our races. And, and we talked about um, being able to be a place where people wanted to work and, and um, pressing down that vacancy rate. We talked about building the engine for partnerships because that was going to be a, a key strategy for us to climb out is to work with our partners and, and vendors and nonprofits in the area um, because that's, that's an asset we have that others don't. Uh, we talked about product project execution and said um, the city, what we were going to do is re deconstruct project management as a concept and say nothing in, in government about the projects we do in technology is one time. You know, when we release it, that's the beginning of the journey, um, and everything has a life cycle and a continuing view of what happens to the customer, both um, the staff that use it, as well as the public that uses the solutions that they provide. And so we're going to build a product project office that, that has the life cycle um, and product concepts and built into it 
uh, unlike a lot of our peers. And then we said along the way, we're also going to have a few opportunities to really change the game. So when we talk about how we approach cybersecurity through alliance and data, um, then, then that's going to be different in a CIO, CISO partnership as opposed to a conflict. That's going to be one thing. When we talk about privacy, we said um, we're going to plan for this now because we know it's coming. Um, digital inclusion wasn't going to be someone else's problem, but it's going to be part of the IT um, portfolio as well. So all of these things, and, and it isn't quite serial, but the better you get at the ones on the left, the more the ones on the right become possible. Um, and for this one, um, it's busy, but you only have to look at the top row. Um, so, so congratulations. Um, but <laughs> we said really IT in the past has been about um, supporting specific technologies, and that's no longer good enough. Um, if technology is going to have its um, focus in the right place, we're actually going to focus on what it is enabling. And then all throughout that, what is it securing? So building that secure city, but allowing our, our um, employees and, and peers to collaborate and communicate uh, all the way through to having uh, open data to be able to do data-driven decisions and to engage the community in, in that same data. Uh, we talked about business automation, so making our work work. Um, but underneath that, uh, on the water surface, there's a lot of other work that we had to plan for and build our organization to, to handle. And then we also said, um, as important as anything, is the organizational blueprint. Technology and government are powered by people. Um, and if we're going to have all those services be well positioned, there needs to be the right technical and functional and leadership um, in, in the right places in the organization to do that. So we mapped this out, and, and just as a high level, we said we will have an information security officer to make sure we are a secure city. We're going to talk about digital services and blending in with Michelle Tong's group, and, and so that would have to be how do we build and sustain the technologies that she would need. We talked about an enterprise architecture so we can rationalize and get the maximum bang for the buck across the city, um, as well as the traditional applications, infrastructure operations. Um, and then the other key thing we said was the product projects office, how we execute, how we deliver on the investments that council makes is going to be very definitive of our success. The next um, two slides um, are, are really more conceptual for internal, but uh, with a lean city, we also want to be very clear that how we build our portfolio is going to match that resource picture. So even though um, you might want to have a 20-person um, um, development team to be able to do a lot of customer-centric build, custom build like a Facebook, um, that wasn't going to be our picture. So what we're trying to do is bridge a resource picture with a maximum capabilities picture. And we said that's going to be achieved through a business strategy of we're going to do a lot of off the shelf. We're going to have some platforms like the PeopleSoft or the Oracle Service Clouds um, or others where we use one platform, skill up on it, and meet lots of needs. So leverage um, uh, one of the questions you guys asked earlier. Um, and then custom was going to have to be a very small percentage because it takes the most, it's the riskiest, and has the highest ongoing liability to it. So we had to build that picture and build our organization around it. But we also said we're going to kind of do the second generation of DevOps, and this matches the theme of um, when you build something, it's only the start. Um, so there is the matter of configuring, developing, testing, and releasing it. But the sustained picture has to be there. And that means the skills and security also have to be there. But this is an internal practice set uh, around IT service management that we have on the inside of the IT organization. Um, we also um, said that we want to test ourselves. So we had a, um, a very deep dive into the analysis, took about five months to do that work, met with 160 stakeholders, met with a good portion of the vendor community to say, what do you see coming as a thought process and thought leader? Um, and we then brought together a, a very formidable group of folks to say, now challenge us. Have we thought things through correctly, and, and where do we get it right, and where do we get it wrong? Uh, just to give the people on the committee um, a, uh, some extra credit, is we had a partner from Bain, a partner from Anderson Horowitz, we had the executive director for the Center for Digital Government, we had the CTO for Intel, we had a director of technologies for PricewaterhouseCoopers, we had a director from um, Prospect Silicon Valley. So we had a really formidable group here to say, um, chief technology officer for big data for um, Dell EMC, um, and, and a formal group, and they said, you, you've done a great analysis, but your hopes are too high compared to the resource picture you have. So br be brutally honest and further refine what you need to get done in these next three years. And that's what we did um, with their feedback. And we'd find two things. 
One was here's our game board. We said um, even though we have 160 opportunities, um, we're going to focus in on, on this set of opportunities to get done in that time frame. And we also took all that work, all those months, all those um, thousands of pages of asset reports and, and project status reports and boiled it down to one page of strategy. And we said out of the decade of disinvestment, we're going to execute, secure, and, and sustain the civic solutions that allow San Jose to thrive. And the four main concepts is we're going to re-engage our team so that they shine. We're going to re-platform onto modern um, solutions so we make our work work. Uh, we're going to secure the city because um, our success heading forward is going to be defined by our cybersecurity resilience. And then we're going to make that product project office maximize the investments that council makes. So when you invest, we need to say, we need to deliver. Um, and, and that will then um, encourage further investments and give the confidence across the organization that as we do this, we're going to build it as a capacity and it's going to be what we called organizational muscle. Along with that, uh, council asked us to do a couple things. Um, one was the IT strategic plan itself. The other, they said we need the CRM um, system, which was what we evolved into My San Jose uh, 1.x. Um, and we also said the importance of data um, and the business process automation was a piece of that where we need to get through and pass all the paper processes of the city. On the right side, you'll see the key five metrics that we built around. Uh, and so when you say key results at the end of the three-year journey, uh, customer satisfaction is, are we, um, do we have the trust we need in the organization that we're, we're meeting their needs and helping them to deliver value? Project success, um, the 80% that you see is we, uh, our philosophy is anything above and we're probably giving ourselves too many project softballs, anything below and we're wasting too much. So there's an equilibrium to be found there. IT service reliability, that's another trust factor is when we have things and they're operating, um, we want people to never think of it and never worry of it. Um, because if we're doing our job well and, and the investments are being made, everything was just going to work. And the employee engagement, we want to go from the bottom 8th percentile to the 50th percentile. Um, I, I originally had this higher and my, uh, my staff cried at me and uh, the Gallup poll said you're reaching even too high. Um, so when you say 80th percentile, just know no one's there. So we said, all right, 50th is a reasonable one then. And then uh, IT is a percentage of the city budget. We want to have ongoing funding being 2.5%. So where are we after two years? Um, this is the organizational blueprint that we had. Um, all the ones where you see kind of an oval shape are the ones where the position does not exist still. Um, and all the ones where they're squares are ones where we have the position exists and the, the functions being done. So we've made significant progress. Uh, where we still need to make some ground is the enterprise architecture and working across departments so that we have our investments being very clean and consistent through the organization. But in the other areas, we've made significant progress that you'll be able to see in some of the numbers that we're now able to deliver. Um, one of the other things that we talked about was council saying you need to fill your positions. Um, you, you can't have such a small IT shop, the smallest of any big city in the country, and then still have a 36, 37 percent vacancy rate. So what we did is we said we're going to have an in, out, in up, through, across, and back model. Um, and there will be a quiz for that one later. <laughs> but we said um, the traditional hiring process obviously isn't working for us and we can't compete against the pay and perks of private sector. So we're actually going to do something different and we're going to build around new models. We're going to hire people around mission and say, is this a mission that speaks to you? And so we created more intern channels. We have folks from San Jose State University, Santa Clara, East Bay. Uh, we have a program with um, NPower so for veterans to technology, in addition to our traditional hiring process. Uh, we've been able to promote more people. We've been able to implement um, flexible schedules so that people are retained. Uh, we're talking uh, about other people coming into IT. We haven't had as much success there, but we've been able to coach and do the mentorship programs to try to get people across. And then retiree rehires as well. And I'll give you a quick peek at this. Um, uh, we originally, um, on the original thrust, went from about a 37% when we uh, finally had the problem or the uh, plan approved. It got down to a 9% vacancy, and it's um, equalized roughly at the 12 to 14%. So we've been able to sustain that level for the, for the years. So you see where the, the game board started. And over the last two years, here's what we've gotten done and what we have left to do. 
Um, you'll notice a new section also, it's literally a new section, is there's also some things that came up um, that weren't in the original plan but were really important. And we said, all right, we'll add those too and we'll try to get those done as well. But we're also going to talk with the organization as we get things done. Is the next thing we're doing still the highest priority or did something else come up that, that is of more importance? And so a couple of things we talked about related to that is having to insert the new EOC, uh, Emergency Operations Center. We talked about the 911 audit. Uh, we talked about the, re the importance of records management um, for PRAs, public records uh, requests, and those kinds of things. The IoT architecture, what we're going to be able to do there. And then we also talked about the modernization fund. And the, the nice thing to report on this one is thanks to the mayor's budget memo, we we're able to switch this from um, red to yellow. And if it gets approved, it'll be green. Um, which will be a wonderful thing and we'll hold a party. Um, but uh, we also have on the innovation roadmap um, some trends that you see in terms of the, the most difficult projects um, being the ones where we usually struggle the most. Um, if it's the most transformative, the most um, that cut across departmental lines as council observed, those are the ones that have taken the most work. The iterative projects have been much more successful. Um, on the red ones, just to do a quick dive um, because Regine covered most of them, my San Jose, once it um, rises above, we have a hiring to do now. The RFP is drafted, uh, but then as we get through the uh, procurement innovation effort, um, there's gonna be a cluster of these that we'll be able to go through and there's four that will go from red to yellow and possibly green. Uh, business tax, as you see there, is still red for IT. That'll switch to on hold for us as soon as we get the lessons learned uh, finished um, with the finance department so we can feed that into the, the uh, new scope of the next project. Um, one last thing to say is on the policy, uh, we, I'm happy to report yesterday afternoon, we had a great meeting with OER and we have a great draft and I think we're gonna be able to get that done by the um, end of April, uh, which will then feed into six audit items which we'll talk about later. Another way to read this, and we'll just rattle them off, is uh, we, so we now have, after two and a half years, a new HR system, a new payroll system, a new talent management system. Um, those are on the cloud. My San Jose 1.x was delivered. We um, migrated and replaced the workers' compensation system and then worked with um, OER HR to move to the third-party administrator. Uh, the utility billing system for about $240 million of, of water wastewater billing has been uh, replaced. We have a new revenue management system, a new treasury management system. We uh, have PCI compliance in place and now have scanners to watch um, our cybersecurity. PCI oh, sorry, credit card um, handling. I'm um, sorry, I, I, uh, I thought I had all the acronyms down. Uh, the, there's a new budget system. Uh, the new uh, financial system, actually new, not new financial system, we had an upgraded financial system that was completed about three weeks ago. Clean energy, we helped them stand up, that was a new project. Uh, infrastructure modernization, that RFP was awarded um, by council in December and we hope to have um, the contract from purchasing in the next two weeks so we can start that project and move it from red to green. Um, cybersecurity advanced services, we have the final, uh, or a good clean draft of that as of uh, Monday or Tuesday. So hopefully we can get that out here in the next few weeks as well. And, and the one big miss uh, we had um, with finance was business tax and we, we are gonna have to restart that and, and council's aware of that one. So where are we on our measures that we said were gonna be very important? Customer satisfaction um, has grown from 74% to 89% as of last, um, last September, October. Project success rate now is at 79%. Um, IT reliability is at 99.4, still not 99.9 .9 and above, but we're gonna get there. IT employee engagement almost quadrupled, uh, so Galp was nice to send us a kind note about, um, about the success there and, and will we still have our eye forward. Core IT as a city budget is now 2%, but that also um, includes a lot of one-time funding. Um, so, but it is ground made and we're very appreciative of that. Expired hardware, we've gone from 71% down to 51%. We wanna get that down to the 20s um, and keep on declining. And vacant IT positions were averaging about 14% uh, over the last few months. Um, thanks. So, uh, um, Cool, again, applause, because IT, we're usually in the... <laughs> um, so we also want to talk about some of the amazing partner work and accomplishments that we do, and, and every one of these is where IT is working with um, uh, council offices, uh, departments, and vendors. And every one of these has played an important role in the ability to emerge out of at least the, the, the darkest of our IT days. Um, and um, the other measure is third-party validation of awards. 
So for the Center for Digital Government, uh, the city had never placed in the top 10 before. We've now pl placed um, number eight and then number six. State Scoop has called us one of the top smart communities and one of the cybersecurity leaders for our strategy. We've won the Oracle Customer Experience Award for My San Jose. IDC, we're a two-time um, Smart City North America World finalist, and with your help, if you can get more votes, we hope to actually win um, a one this year. And we're also a finalist for the American Planning Association Smart City Award for our artificial intelligence transportation uh, management project that we did with uh, transportation. Transportation deserves the, the credit. Um, and we'll find out on Monday if we actually won that award. But we also want to be upfront and honest and, and always challenge ourselves to, to be a clear about the picture. A um, couple things that we were learning through this is the iterative projects are where we succeeded the most. Where we have struggled, as I mentioned, is the highly transformative um, initiatives where it is cross-departmental and big and hairy. Um, one of the things that, that has been defining in that is people struggle because the people you need to run things are also the people you need to do the transformation work. And so the leanness and being one deep in a lot of spots continues to come up. And we're going to have to find out better ways so we can have the right people in the right places and make those projects um, flow better. We talked about process reengineering is not yet a strength in the city. Um, we still honor a lot of um, uh, legacy projects, and we're, we seem to be very proud of those. Um, and then for San Jose departments to work together, there's very low resistance overall to cooperation. But the level of investment is where it, it usually has a hold moment. Um, and we do see the hero um, phenomenon happening here. Is there is um, a, a lot of evidence where there's a few people who make a lot of things happen. And in some ways, it's, it's too much to ask of them because we always want to do the next great thing. Uh, but when there's so few of those superheroes, um, we tax them mightily. And then the IT resource optimization, there's, there's more to be done there where we can optimize the whole city IT spend picture. Um, and there is still tech debt that holds departments back. Everything from people saying, I have a computer from um, uh, 20, uh, 2006, and I have the phenomenon where I boot and go get my coffee and come back and I'm ready to work. Um, some of those don't even support the software that they need, all the way to old systems that don't do things the way that all of us would say seems to be a modern way in terms of an integrated financials budget system. You know, there, there are some, some holes there that we can still fill in. <clears throat> the other thing we said is we're going to keep track um, of what's going to come next. Um, and we did talk about then in the next strategic plan the importance of, of that process reengineering and working with Michelle Tong's group around digital services being a skill. Mobility is still going to be one of the definitive things for our workforce and our public. Artificial intelligence and Internet of Things is going to be definitive of that next plan as well because it's going to has the most promise to help us manage more with less. Location aware and personalized services are going to be key and, and what people expect of government services is going to come closer to some of the consumer services. And then um, because council has asked um, periodically, having the conversation of what is the optimal IT structure and, and skill management pre, um, and resource management picture for the city uh, so that we can make sure that the dollars we invest get the maximum benefit. And with that, before we get into the audits, which are indeed a bit drier, um, any questions and feedback <laughs> from council? Not a question, but you, you did get an applause, and I just want to just echo the outstanding uh, job that you're doing, and the results speak for themselves, and it's really amazing. And you, we're proud of you, and you should be proud of your your department and all the, all the people that are working hard to make those uh, things happen so congratulations I'll, thank you i'll pass that along and as we all know it's it's never us at the uh in the box the team has done amazing work no it's it's definitely a team team effort i did want to make one uh <laughs> suggestion or just one one bit of input and that is that obviously you know with uh technology procurement that is a moving target and you know the, the way the process seems to work now is that you identify a vendor or a product, and if it's over a certain amount, you come to council and, well, first of all, you go through the whole RFP process and then come to council for our approval. Has there been any discussion or are you already doing this in terms of just creating master agreements and then identifying uh, a vendor list and just picking off of that vendor list and not having to go through the whole process every time that you have a, a new product or you know, so, process so, that you want to undertake. Yeah, let, let me take the intro, and then um, we are working very closely with um, finance, purchasing, and, and Dolan and Keshav are leading that initiative for procurement innovation. 
but you're absolutely right. If we can't acquire it, we can't do it. And we have seen where the acquisition piece of these projects um, has held us back in some spots. But there are different methods. And, and one of the things we've talked about with um, uh, NASPO Value Points, National Association of um, Procurement Officers Value Point, it's a consortium of best practices and, and best approaches to procurement because they recognize the same things. And these are procurement professionals. And they've said a couple things that I think are um, resonant here is when you're stressing, is when usually your procurement folks um, are less strategic, when they need to be even more strategic. And so um, how do you get to a point where you can say, this is the structure that I should take at being able to enable the organization? So traditionally, procurement has been about a compliance um, function. Um, so value, transparency, and equal access. And one of the critiques is no one ever added in speed. Mm -hmm. um, so let's, let's throw that in there too in the future. Another one was um, doing co a cooperative procurement. So it, very few of us need to do the one thing and only us doing it. Um, a lot of cases, um, we all have a common need and, and it might have a variant on it, but we can cooperate more with each other. So there are a lot of strategies and a lot of processes and steps we can do, but with that, um, I think Dolan can paint in the rest of the picture. Yeah, yeah thanks Rob, that was a pretty good uh, explanation. So um, you're gonna, you may have noticed on the emerging projects in the Smart City Roadmap that a procurement uh, improvement and readiness program is, mm -hmm. is emerging. It is, uh, it is planned to be kicked off in the new fiscal, <laughs> in the new fiscal year. Um, uh, so what we're, what we're doing right now is we're working on throughput and prioritization. Uh, to Rob's point, uh, we need to get the team's throughput up uh, and we're doing that by we're, we're in the process of developing a prioritization scheme. So we're working the right things at the right time. Let's not, let's not, right now we're working things first in, first now, first out, or whatever DCM yells the loudest in terms of the priorities. Uh, we're coming up with a more strategic way to prioritize the work so people feel comfortable they're working the right thing at the right time. Uh, we're also working on uh, recruiting the vacancies that have been created in procurement as a result of, of departures to other cities and counties that pay more. Uh, once we get the throughput, and we're going to be working on that over the next three months, once we get to July, we're going to be engaging an independent consultant to come in and help us with go, go through our processes, look at areas for uh, improvement. We think there's um, organizational changes that need to be made. We think there's a better balance of the centralization and decentralization because we swung pretty close to being centralized mm -hmm. uh, as a result of some of the phone, ish, phone, phone procurement issues that occurred uh, almost a decade ago. Uh, and then we will um, be looking at the concept of procurement pools as you suggested, as a way to make things go faster. We may have to come back. There may actually need to be some Unico changes as a result of some of the constraints, the box to say mm -hmm. that we were put in, and all of that's going to start kicking off in, in July. Uh, we have confidence we're going to be doing that, so we're actually working on that uh, RFP for those consulting services to make those procurement improvements as we speak. Great. Thank you. Mayor Licardo? Hi. I began the applause because I really think, uh, as I've said before, Rob, we're incredibly lucky that you landed here. So thank you for your leadership and you built a great team and it's really wonderful to see um, see them take off. Um, a couple questions. Um, as we go back to the, the, the challenge around filling the vacancies, there was a slide there that described the, the four primary ways um, where you're, you've been trying to, to build the team. And one of them had to do with skilling up within the building. Um, there it is. Yeah, transition to tech. I believe, I assume that's existing employees who are not in tech and that getting them into IT jobs. Correct. How successful have we been with that specifically? I know that's something. Not at all. Okay. Um, it's, so it it's, is it's something really hard to do, I know. Yeah. Um, and, and it is where you see people working with us in projects that would like to take their career in that new direction. Um, we work really well with some folks, but um, no one at, up to this point has said, I'd like to make that, that cross. But we want to be ready for when that happens. And, and um, as part of our um, employee development programs, have some of those that are open to others and other departments as well. Um, because those can be very powerful transitions. Yeah. Um, and uh, those people can make a, a world of difference because they understand it from the customer's point of view so well. So, you, Rob, you probably know we've got a lot of partnerships going on right now with community colleges. So we're trying to find ways uh, to help folks reskill as well as helping um, 
many of our, our younger students who are uh, who don't have the means to be able to get in college and beyond and um, and I'm just wondering to what extent um, would there be value in having a conversation off offline of course about how we could have community colleges help to provide uh, some skills to folks who may be good candidates within the building who are looking at maybe their jobs may be coming obsolete but mm -hmm. if we have an opportunity if they're uh, if they're really inclined well to IT to be able to get them skilled up in nine months to, to two years, something like that. It, is that is that realistic or? Um, it, it absolutely is in certain jobs. So some of our jobs really require enough of a technical acumen that the, the bridge is too hard. Yeah. Um, but for some of them, it actually has worked. And we've worked with Jeff Ruster and worked to Future. I've had a, a couple opportunities there as well. Um, I'll tell you, the top left, that has been um, our best strategy. So when you count our interns, our actual vacancy rate by people is less than 5%. There, we have enough other people coming in through that channel that they're filling in some of the gaps. We've hired two of them, um, and in our projects, they very often are our top kudos getters. So we actually report our kudos, which are notes from customers that someone's made a real good difference for them. We take them out to lunch every month, and the interns have been um, some of the biggest attendees of that because the wow. energy is there, anything's possible. Um, and, and so that, that model on the left has really been where we've been the most successful. Those are primarily San Jose State students or? Uh, San Jose State, we have uh, one East Bay um, and one Santa Clara University, mm -hmm. um, but um, primarily the colleges um, and, and just have shined in the two that we've hired a great employees. They're just truly wonderful. Wonderful, uh, glad to see that's working well. Uh, so um, just one other question about the, the KPs that you display and that you've been working on for the last two or three years. Have you ever given that presentation internally to other managers in the city? Um, no, I haven't. Is I that think that would be a great thing <laughs> just to throw that out. I, okay. I, mean, I know there are some departments that are doing this, some departments that could learn a lot, I think, and this would be a wonderful thing. Okay, we'll take that. Anyway, just throw that out. All right, you still have time to go, or another part of this, right, Rob? Okay, let's keep going. <clears throat> All right, cool. So this is the drier part, um, and it's our audits update. Um, so just in terms of uh, retrospect, in 2016 when we came to you, actually it was um, early 2017 to talk about the strategic plan, uh, we said tech debt um, is one of the, the highest indicators is mounting audits. And sure enough, in 2016, we had three alone. Um, and so we, in terms of counsel, they really wanted us, or you really want us to focus on the customer call handling first. So we put a lot of energy around that. Um, the, cut, the general controls and the technology deployments were very security specific. Then the financial statements audit came up and that had some security specific items as well. And so we said, we're going to pull that together. It's where we came up with the concept for this uh, chief security officer and the cybersecurity work plan. Um, and then most recently, um, literally last month, we had the 911-311 um, call handling audit that we've thrown into this. And because of prioritization, that's going to jump in line as well. As part of council's priorities, there are two um, that we want to highlight specifically. So in the 2012 general controls audit, one was develop and test a disaster data recovery plan. I'm happy to report that uh, as of this weekend, we're actually gonna be testing uh, the city's um, ability to recover it's critical applications and servers and systems um, off-site, uh, which will be a major accomplishment. Um, it'll be the first. And then we also have the security policy and compliance actions as um, the 2012 audit number four. And with the security policy, if we get that done by the end of April as planned, then that would be resolved too. So we're, we're ha tracking towards getting two of these to resolution in the next quarter. Um, just to go through them quickly and, and to give you the traffic light status on each of those, uh, the IT general controls, there were 11 items, six are done, uh, five are in progress. Um, sorry about the tab spacing on that one, something changed. Um, customer call handling, we're completely done and we finished that and closed that audit. Technology deployments, um, we have nine, um, eight are complete, completed and closed and we have one left, so that one should be done here by the middle of this year. External audits on financial statements, um, a lot of that depends on the IT um, policy, security policy, which again, we hope to get done in the next month and then we'll be able to make more progress on that. Um, mobile devices is the one we've put to the bottom of the queue in, in terms of importance to the city as 911-311 came up um, and um, the disaster recovery and council priorities came up. This is the one that we've, we've positioned lower um, it, because it doesn't cause an operating um, uh, failure 
but it is some gain in optimization that we can do, and we still want to accomplish it. But the 911-311 is where we're going to put a lot of energy in the next three months so we can bring on that analyst and take the call pressure, the call load pressure off of our friends in 911 and bring it to the 311 uh, true, uh, customer contact center for true 311 type handling. Um, we actually related to that one um, just for council's awareness. In the next two months, we're going to start with the systems operations calls and the Department of Transportation calls. So we'll make the first foray here pretty quickly and take those off of fire. Um, so we're trying to follow council's direction and the importance that we need to act with haste on these. Um, this is a visualization of the progress that we've been trying to make. Um, so we had a lot of um, sustained audit items where we uh, collected them for a while. Um, and now we're trying to uh, arc towards getting those off of our plate. We dream of the day when we don't have to come to the city auditor's annual or the semi-annual update. Um, and, uh, and, and we will show a party at that time too. But um, you can see the progress we're making in each uh, individual one. The one flat line that you see under orange is the um, uh, financial statement. And that, again, will get more progress once the security policy is done because we will manage to that. This is the overall. <clears throat> the reason why this isn't um, steeping down more is because we keep on adding new audits in 2016 and 2019. So if we can just stop that. Um, but uh, <laughs> but uh, overall, we'll, uh, we do have a track towards getting finished um, and uh, want council to be aware that we, we do prioritize these items and we're, we're going to continue to work them until done. So with that, if any questions or comments, I'll, I'll take those as well. We have one public commenter, Mr. Blair Beekman. Hi, uh, I wanted to thank you uh, for first off of ask, uh, for this subject and talking about uh, Councilperson Jones asked about the subject of procurement and it was a very nice answer that you offered and it was it was very interesting to learn how you're just talking about the subject of procurement and um, I felt uh, in 2016 or so uh, from the VTA uh, there was a work on uh, new uh, uh, camera policies for their for surveillance cameras on their buses and there was a new guideline process uh, put into place I guess it's called CCTV cameras and it was that sort of thinking that came along with that at that time that asked for a good procurement process that would go along with the uh, with the CCTV guidelines uh, and how to talk with uh, vendors and people who will be around the subject. So, you know, the ideas of accountability uh, are really important. Uh, can really help develop the procurement process and you're just learning how it's possible to talk about that publicly after it sounds like years <laughs> that it hasn't been, uh, it just hasn't been. And, um, you know, the work that I'm doing with accountability, uh, it's a subject that's free and it doesn't cost any money. And I hope that, uh, you know, that could be along the lines of how you need to think about uh, how this whole technology process is, is how you mentioned how you're going to try to work its philosophy can, can apply in the same way. And, um, yeah, I hope you can keep up the efforts to talk about uh, what can be good accountability and, um, and, and, and make it a, a process how to talk about everyday people more. I have to learn that myself, actually, how this can talk about everyday people more. Thank you. All right. Um, I, I, at the risk of, um, you know, well, I guess this was really a great report. I don't know why we moved it to put it in the middle, because it was exciting to me. Yeah, not dry uh, at all, Dolan. So, so not, not dry at all. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> um, I, I, <laughs> looking ahead, I, I do want to ask, um, to the extent that IT is a bridge, right? We're building a bridge, and, and you're, you're alluding to maintenance, and we're trying to catch up because we've, we've neglected the maintenance. But we also know that technology becomes outdated fairly frequently. So what type of resources do you think, assuming we're able to get to, you know, whatever the standard of 2019, 2020 is, um, what, what do we have to do to, to, to stay on top of that curve? 
Um, I, I'd say two things. One is as we do projects heading forward, we do factor in what it takes to keep that system in, uh, going through. So when we talk about hardware, we talk about software, we talk about mm -hmm. services, maintenance, and people. And that is part of the discussion that didn't happen as much before. And, and we've talked with procurement and budget and, and Kip and Dolan. Um, and that, that has to be a part of the conversation so you don't um, cut yourself short because you didn't uh, treat it correctly. Um, on procurement, if I can just interject a little bit, um, they're, some, they're great professionals. They're some of our best partners. And I'm actually looking forward to seeing what we can come up with in terms of procurement innovation because you've got such smart, dedicated people here we're literally trading messages and, and calling each other 8, 9 p.m. So everyone's working hard. If we can just raise our heads to the horizon and say, here's what serves the city best and, and allows us to do good adherence and follow good rules and protect the city, but also move to, to be innovative, I, I think no one's gonna be as powerful and compelling as us on that one. And then the last answer to your question I'll give you, um, Chairman, is um, uh, as part of the budget process, my philosophy is the budget process is as much for government um, emblematic of their character as anything else that they do. And in that budget process, we have to do a good job in IT of making sure our managers can speak what it takes to implement a project and then sustain it, um, and then carry that message all the way through budget office and city manager to you. Um, and, and if everyone has that understanding, you make better decisions by saying this investment's worth it or not, as opposed to just seeing I want X at maybe a, um, an uninformed number um, we have to be able to have that conversation more fully with you and, and be prepared on our side. And then just finally, um, lastly, are we still on track to be the America's most innovative city by 2020? I'm going to push uh, really hard. Um, and then if we do, we'll all go to the, the award ceremony together. Um, and uh, <laughs> um, I, I don't know where it is going to be this year, but it was a lot of fun last year with, with uh, Vice Mayor Jones. <laughs> But our, our goal is to get number one in um, 2020, so. Right, okay. All right, moving on, thank you. Uh, motion to accept the report? And, or, and sorry. Yeah, the question. Uh, Mayor Licardo, sorry. Yeah, thank you. I, just a um, statement and a question. First, um, when we do become America's most invasive city, we're actually gonna host the whole event, so <laughs> that'll make it a lot easier. Um, so, um, a question about the, the, the hiring specifically and the vacancies and the chart that you showed us with the, the rectangles and the different shaped, I don't know what they were. Oh, um, they were ovals or something? Kind of. <laughs> Does that reflect positions that are simply not budgeted or are there positions there that are budgeted that we have not been able to hire? Those are unbudgeted positions almost all with, with um, two exceptions. Um, but um, we, we are one deep in a lot of those areas. So even the the one position that's there is doing other things too. So most of these are just absent positions we would expect in an organization our size. Got it, okay, so it's purely a budget issue at this point. And could we get a budget document or a MBA that would describe what's, what's the cost all in here? <laughs> and then help us understand what the highest priority items are? our highest priority people, I should say, in terms of what our greatest needs are. Yes. That would be super helpful. Appreciate that. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, guys. All right, on the motion. Uh, yeah, what? Yeah. All in favor, yeah. Aye. 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 <laughs> All right, motion passes. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. On to the next thing. Uh, thank you. While we move on to the, the next topic, as the director of the Office of Civic Innovation, I'm somewhat offended to say we're not already the most innovative city in, in America. I don't think we need to wait till 2020, but I, for, I guess for party planning purposes, we'll wait until uh, the end of the year to make that celebration. <laughs> So moving on uh, to the final topic of the day, uh, we're going to be talking about autonomous vehicles. And I'm kind of jumping to the end, but what's exciting about what you're going to see here is twofold. Um, you'll see that Jill North is now the interim information technology manager. So in fact, she is someone who has moved from a innovation role to a technology role. So we do have some of those uh, transitions taking place. So congratulations. 
Uh, and then secondly, what you're going to see is, here is that real connection between the, the technology and the concepts and the actual community service. I think what's really cool about the strategy you're going to see and how it's evolved recently is, is we're finding areas to help the underserved community with autonomous vehicles, especially disabled and those that have sight challenges, and figuring out how to take this rather flashy, press release -y concept of autonomous vehicles and actually make it deliver, uh, make it deliver real community benefits. Uh, into an area we might not have expected. People were expecting autonomous vehicles are going to be for wealthy people that can stream their videos in, in their cars while it's driving itself, but we're finding opportunities to, to serve the underserved community as well with autonomous vehicles. So with having that introduction, I'll turn it over to Jill North, our Interim Information Technology Manager. Thank you, Dawn. That was a really nice introduction. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Chair, members of the committee and members of the public. My name is Jill North, as Dolan mentioned, Interim Information Technology Manager for the Department of Transportation. And this update really serves to kind of collectively pull together all of the efforts that we've had over the last year and a half and all of the updates and kind of put them into one comprehensive strategy. There's a lot of moving pieces and I think some of the feedback that I've gotten was we really would like to see where all these things fit together. So um, one of the, and another question that sometimes I get from time to time is why are autonomous vehicles important to the city of San Jose? And you know, really, this, this technology ha can have such a tremendous impact in helping us achieve some of our really critical goals that we have not been able to make a whole lot of progress on around equity and safety and all of those types of things. It is critical that we are leaders in this space, and that's why we, we spend a lot of time on it and thinking about all of the different ways we can make this work to truly realize all of the value that it will bring to the table. So our, our AV strategy follows an iterative and comprehensive approach. We began in 2017 with setting some guiding principles and analyzing data. That was with the AV RFI. I will also analyze some data today, but that's an ongoing effort. Using those guiding principles and the data provided, we developed key initiatives of actions that we could take within our department or doing some cross-departmental collaboration, and I'll highlight some of that work. Then developing a foundational plan and implementing it. So that goes to some of the update that I provided in the December update, um, and we'll, we'll go over that. Piloting the project, then measuring the performance and evaluating and starting all over again, constantly trying to iterate upon what we learned from the past to better put solutions in for the future. So the first step was our guiding principles and setting those for the AV strategy. All of our work in the AV space really seeks to address one or several of these areas in order to fully realize the benefits that AVs could have in our community. So we have data, obtaining data, doing data sharing that really could be um, transformative in terms of how we operate our transportation ecosystem working to reduce vehicle miles traveled. We want to see people get out of their single occupancy vehicles. We want to plug them back into the transportation network and use autonomous vehicles as last, first last mile connections when possible. We want to have those livable communities where cars don't overrun our community, people do, um, in a very wonderful way. Safety, always important. And that, that's kind of the only reason why it's the biggest circle. It's, it is our mission as a department. and these vehicles really will have a tremendous impact in helping achieve our goals around Vision Zero. Equity is one of something that I personally am very passionate about. As we continue to look at more technology solutions, the gap between people who are included and are not is just getting wider and wider. And so when we really think about the users that could truly benefit from an autonomous vehicle service, we want to seek out opportunities to plug them in from the get-go so that the technology is being developed with them in mind and at the forefront, and finally a balanced transportation system as well. Uh, in the December Smart Cities and Service Improvements Committee meeting, I did do a very um, involved analysis around um, autonomous vehicle testing that's occurring in California. I'm going to have kind of an update to that, but just as a reminder, the California DMV does issue four types of permits. 
Um, the first is testing with a driver. There's currently 62 permits that have been issued to companies to do that. There's one driverless testing permit that has been issued, that's Waymo. There have been zero deployment um, permits issued. And the difference between testing and deployment really comes down to whether you're allowed, well, whether you're obtaining um, payment for the ride or not. And also a really important note is that we are the home of the majority of these AV companies. I took the 62 companies that have permits and mapped them out and we'll get to a little bit more of a breakdown of that. But as you can see, they are very, very much so located right in our backyard. In February 2019, California DMV released the annual disengagement reports, and those are the reports that I base a lot of the analysis off of. Um, we did a very thorough um, report about the 2017 data. I was able to update that and also provide an analysis of 2018 data. And so we're looking at a modest increase in the number of companies that have started testing on public roadway. So even though there's 62 permit holders, you're seeing that not all of them have actually tested um, on public roadway. Some of that is, you know, that they're starting up. Some of the reasons why that they have an operational design domain where their solution is, you know, focused on a parking garage or something like that. You also see a very drastic increase in the total miles driven on California public roadways and about a little less than 100, well, some more vehicles. Um, so some of the, there was a breakdown on the memo, um, if you wanted to kind of dive into that full data analysis, but some of the key insights were that the majority of autonomous vehicles driven, that's 80%, and the number of vehicles operated, um, 65, were by two companies. So GM Cruise and Waymo are continuing to have the, the most vehicles and the most um, number of miles driven. The majority of AV companies as a whole, though, still drove less than 10,000 miles in a year and operate less, uh, fewer than five vehicles. And when you think about pilot testing, it kind of is an indication um, of what companies will really be able to do. If they have less than five vehicles, there's a good chance that they're not gonna be able to um, have those vehicles do the type of service that we envision. So it's kind of an indicator of how much you can engage with them in a pilot. Um, to really provide a solution. And then another really important note is that there, even though Waymo does have a driverless testing permit, they have not driven a single driverless mile in the state of California on public roadway. On to key initiatives. Um, so from our guiding principles, we took a couple of actions um, that we thought would really relate into some of the things, the work that we should be doing to better prepare as a city. Some of these examples include partnering with our police department to start developing an, a safety plan, understanding what their needs would be. We've been having conversations about potentially going to a private track to practice and do training around, you know, pulling over an autonomous vehicle, how they would interact. Um, looking at data, so really trying to develop that data analytics capacity and form the data exchange model. We've made some progress there in our negotiations with um, autonomous vehicle companies. Um, and then a really good example is engaging the community to shape future streets with design thinking. That is the IDEO pilot that we're really looking at reimagining um, how we can engage with our community to better prepare for the future. So those were just a few that I wanted to highlight. Moving into the 2019 AV plan. So this is kind of the, our focused er effort for the duration of the year, um, is that when we, we had identified four foundational areas that we thought if we really wanted to build a sustainable program, that we would need to focus on these areas and make movement. And so a lot of this was kind of based off analysis and based off of feedback from industry. And then things that we ran into that were challenging in order to get some of our first pilots off the ground that we needed to really kind of think about. So specifically proactively engaging with the communities that are in a 
positioned to benefit from our partnership, identifying opportunities to provide digital information for autonomous vehicle testing and deployment, um, taking a look at our own capabilities and upgrading if necessary, and working with cross-jurisdictional um, agencies. And so I, there's a progress bar to the left that kind of indicates how much progress we've been able to make on each of these since the December meeting. When we were looking at the autonomous vehicle partnership opportunities, and this is where we did a lot of analysis, we first asked ourselves, what companies are within 20 miles of San Jose? And the reason why we asked that question was when we looked at the disengagement reports in the DMV data, one of the key things that we saw over and over again is that autonomous vehicle companies are generally testing within 20 miles of wherever their autonomous vehicle base station location is. And there's a lot of reasons for that when I reached out to industry to kind of better understand why. Um, one of the reasons was because if they need to do a hardware configuration, they need to be able to easily access um, those engineers. If there was a software update, these, these vehicles have upwards of 200 sensors, being able to offload all of that data and go back to return to the base and then general um, maintenance and things like that. So we started with those and we narrowed the list of 62 down to 42. And there's kind of a breakdown of where all of them are that were not included um, as well. And then we said, okay, of those 42, which ones have tested on public roads within the past 24 months? If they have a vehicle and they're testing on public roadway, they're getting to be to a point that they might be prime opportunities to partner with. And so then that 42 went down to 25. And then we did a little bit of data cleansing, kind of identifying from that list who's already in partnership with the city. So, you know, we already have several partners um, who's no longer active in the industry, um, if they've moved out of California or if they're already scaling. And so we finally are on 18 companies um, that we can focus on. We're looking to establish points of contacts and definitely provide um, some of the pot potential partnership opportunities that we have in order to take a look at what's possible in 2020. The second effort um, of the AV plan was to um, digitize information that support AV de deployments. And this really was a lot of, this was, this was a result of a lot of conversations within, with, with industry partners about what the needs were. Um, the first one, Transportation Data Platform, which is the partnership that we have with Urban Logic, was actually an internal need that we identified as we needed a place for all this data to live. Um, and it was a piece of feedback that we got from industry is if we provided you data, where would it go? Um, and so that was where that uh, idea really originated. So now we have a place where when we are obtain that data, it can live with our other transportation data sets so we can make better decisions. The second initiative was around high definition, obtaining a high definition map. So before autonomous vehicle companies go out and test on the road, they get a base layer map of where all the measurements of all the, the objects are, and then they start to build scenarios off of that map. That map is also incremental in the simulation of autonomous vehicle testing before they go on roadway. So the um, autonomous vehicle software is run through simulation algorithms that really, um, the idea is that it is the virtual environment of the real world. Um, and so we really saw a value if we identified locations where we thought that autonomous vehicles could provide a benefit to already kind of have a high definition map available to kind of guide our partners in those directions and to provide some of that support. We signed an MOU with Sanborn um, to start looking at what areas uh, they would like to map in, in, or in the areas that we kind of identified as well, which I'll get to in a moment. And finally, real-time construction zone information. Uh, we have planned construction information available on our website, but really it's the incidentals that you're not expecting that could change how an autonomous vehicle would need to route or anticipate a change. And so we identified a company called Hazalert who um, we can use our Verizon telematics feed and they will provide the cleaned up version of where those real time construction locations are happening and potentially either feed it into the high definition map to make it richer or to the autonomous vehicle company itself that we're partnering with. 
And so that we're targeting to pilot with them in June of 2019. The third and fourth foundational effort included updating our system and collaborating with cross-jurisdictional organizations. Our signal phase and timing feed was previously going to a third party, and one of the things that we realized when we were negotiating for the pilot program was that there can't be that, that inherent latency, so we identified that TransCore had a functionality um, to basically provide that feed from the source, which completely reduces that latency challenge. So we made that change over the last couple months. And we worked with VTA to identify routes that have been or plan to be discontinued. So gaps in our transportation system. So now we have six different examples where um, there's a real opportunity for uh, companies to kind of plug and play. All right, so we act, one of the other items that I committed to in the last Smart Cities meeting was to look for two to three pilot opportunities to start up in, within 2019. And we have three. So the first is the one that we, we know about. That is the Mercedes-Benz Bosch and Daimler um, project that will be starting in fall of 2019. Really, we're hoping for August. It's a point-to-point -point solution from Deardon to Santana Row. But the news is that we've teamed up with the San Jose chapter of the Federation of the Blind. And we're really um, excited about this opportunity because folks who are visually impaired really have a true challenge being connected into our transportation network. And a lot of this technology, like I said, um, the focus is not necessarily on who can really benefit. And so by this partnership, partnering up with, with these other entities is really going to help Mercedes, Bosch, and Daimler think about how to design for everyone. And it'll also provide us insights into how we can make changes in our infrastructure to better um, assist folks that have um, disabilities as well. The second pilot is with AutoX Technologies. We're targeting a fall 2019 launch with them as well. And they would basically be replicating the dash route that's planned to be discontinued when the Berryessa BART station comes up. And so the target user group we're looking for here is you know, staff and students from San Jose State University. And then finally, with, with um, Berryessa BART opening up, we're looking at a connection for those employees to basically get out of their cars on A80, use BART, and now they have a seamless um, ex transportation experience from BART to their job. So we're kind of getting to the next steps. We're going to implement the projects over um, at that, towards the end of the year. And then we need to measure the performance and evaluate. We're going to learn all kinds of things about what worked, what didn't work, um, and then kind of set new goals after we evaluate those outcomes and then iterate to improve and start the process all over again with more partners, um, bringing more solutions to our residents and our communities. And I think that it will ultimately continue to be a sustainable program. And just to kind of wrap it all up, I put it all together on a timeline in terms of where we started at and where we're at and where we're going. So in, you know, in June of 2017, we had um, we had roundtables, and then in June of 2017, we issued out the RFI. We started working on the key initiatives, executing the MOU with Mercedes. Um, and then, you know, today we've developed the AV plan. We've got the Urban Logic platform. Uh, we've executed the MOU with AutoX. We've executed the MOU with Sanborn. So our next steps really are executing the project agreements, which are moving along and continuing um, the plan execution that I articulated earlier, launching those pilots, monitoring the performance, measuring how we did against our guiding principles, and evaluating and setting new goals. So I think that's the last slide. Yes. And I really am hoping to get some really great feedback um, on where we're going, if, if you're supportive of where we're going, if there's something that you can you think of to provide that feedback. This is all very new. and and um, really excited to have such an amazing project to work on, truly. All right, well, we have a public commenter, Mr. Beekman.
Thank you for your words. Uh, it was nice to learn how you spoke about it. Uh, it was nice to hear how you spoke about it. Thank you. I have a, a big speech uh, here. I hope you can bear with it. Uh, to try to speak to a broader picture of the economics around the possible future around automated vehicles, the mayor, and the mayor has recently tried to offer we can all have an important role to help question and to help decide how to navigate the future of possible upcoming economic downturns and threats of the uh, of major economic recessions in the future called uh, periods of disruption. Uh, these periods of di disruption also have uh, upcoming economic downturns that are possible. And how all of this can then relate to the difficult issues of how to raise the height limits of buildings at downtown San Jose. The work of my own life at this time uh, talks about accountability. But to, to move forward, as many people of San Jose have been politely warned by VTA lectures, at this time last year and by the mayor earlier this year, how will we each individually heed these warnings of economic downturns and major recessions? I feel the current economic questions we are asking ourselves for the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years can be very much related to the use of energy. And do we ask at this time what sort of economic world do we want to collectively work towards at this time? And do we ask, what do the people around the autom autonomous vehicle industry want to be willing to work towards at this time as well? By the mid-2020s, amongst many reasons, there may have to be uh, important decisions made about the future of fracked oil, natural gas, and coal compared with the growing simplicity of a more sustainable, viable options for the uses of energy as a U.S. society and for the planet. And we are at a time to better learn how to use uh, solar energy and its practices. In other words, we are starting to more fully address subjects of climate change and how the future of energy that did not want to be talked about in the early 19, uh, in 2010s, how can we talk about these uh, changes now that uh, won't hurt ourselves economically or that we have to go through the process of war in the, in the near future? Thank you. All right, Vice Mayor Jones. Okay. Um, I, first of all, my feedback is I'm incredibly excited about, about this project and all the hard work that you've done already. And uh, I'm just ready for it to, to happen and, and, and get going on it. And I did have a, just a couple of quick questions. Uh, a lot of the, well, all the areas that you've uh, discussed are very high tech. And one of the um, pieces of feedback that I got it might have been from your group or from uh, one of the um, companies is that uh, one of the most important things that they are looking at in terms of support from the city is something very low tech like paint. So can you uh, kind of update me on the low tech issues that we have to address? Yes, that is actually, you're completely right. Um, I didn't highlight that in here but that is work that we have done. Um, one, it's really interesting, you know, the paint is, it allows the sensors to be able to pick up and measure the environment really, really clearly. If you have a, a nice, a nicely painted road and nicely painted curb. And so that was one of the pieces of, um, that was one of the initiatives that we did as well, was we took a look at, you know, for the pickup and drop off locations, really re-looking at the curb and thinking about how to make it easy to have a Montana's vehicle pick up and drop off to kind of help guide it. Um, and also that roadway is getting repaved um, along that major route so the paint will be very fresh as well. We also talked to 3M about some of their different solutions um, around paint and how that could potentially be something that we partner with them on in the future as well. Okay, and so have we uh, resolved the um, issue of the drop-off point at Santana Row? Yes. The curb and the paint and Yes, the we did, okay. yes. It's, it's already, and actually, you know, before they put in a solution where they're doing um, pick up and drop off of passengers, they do have to do quite a bit of testing, get miles on those cars. So they are targeting to start their initial kind of soft launch, I think it's next month. Um, so that'll be, we should be seeing those cars on the road soon. They're not, they're gonna be in the very beginning phase of, of their, their testing, but they will be going back and forth and testing out the initial um, gathering scenarios from the map. Okay, and then, so that kind of ties into my next question in terms of profile. So are these cars gonna be clearly marked as 
autonomous vehicles. Uh, so just residents and other commuters or people on the road n know that, you know, these, this pilot is taking place and we have autonomous vehicles on the road to kind of create exposure and awareness? Yeah, they have a, a special wrap on the vehicles from what I saw from the um, design is that it's, it's a white vehicle with kind of almost polka dots. Um, like different colors of blue and it says aut autonomous vehicle on it. It's got the brand on there. So they're not, it's kind of like street view. You're going to notice that the car is different than the traditional cars from the wrap. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Hello, Jill. Thanks for that report. Um, I'm excited to learn that uh, Barry S. Bart is, is under consideration. Um, it wasn't last time. I never asked you to do that, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, Please answer for the record. I never asked. You. <laughs> no, you did not. Okay. Okay. Um, are we? One of the goals here was um, to engage companies in the best position to benefit from AV technology. Are we working with? Uh, was it Prospect Silicon Valley on that at all? Because I think they've done some of that work. We've definitely worked with Prospect Silicon Valley on several initiatives. I think, um, and especially kind of connecting us into those different partners, they're, they're pretty well connected. And so definitely they've been instrumental in helping facilitate those conversations. So we are still close. Okay. And I, I like the, the strategy and especially how we're not just bringing AV technology into our city, but we're bringing it with a public purpose to help the visually impaired, to help you know, reduce traffic along 880, um, and help San Jose State students with, with the, um, the expiration of the DASH um, shuttle. I, I've seen other cities put out press releases you know, saying AV is already here, they're already testing it, um, maybe without a public purpose, but, but you know, at least I've seen the buzz in other cities already. So how confident are we that you know, by, the, by this fall or in early 2020, we'll, we'll see driverless vehicles in our city. So I am very confident on one of the pilots that that will, the Mercedes Benz Bosch and Daimler pilot for sure will happen this year. The other pilots are a little bit behind in terms of where, how far they are in their development, not, not on the development, but on the pilot side, just scoping details. Just from experience, those I wouldn't necessarily hold to a hard fall 2019. It might be a little bit later, um, but I'm, I'm confident that we will have them. I know that there are a lot of announcements all the time, and it's really interesting this race, uh, how fast everyone can go. But I think our approach has always been that we're going to demonstrate how it's done right. And it's not going to, what you see with a lot of that launch of a service, a really good example was one that I read about the other day as well. When you don't have a challenge that you're addressing, what you see is everyone tries it out and then that no one else rides in it again. So it's not a sustainable change and we're building that in from the get go. We wanna see people leverage this technology and change their transportation decisions as a result because it's seamless. Excellent. Um, I remember reading a long time ago about AV vehicles and my, recollection is that there's different levels like L1 through 5 yep. about, about how autonomous they are. Mm -hmm. So in order to, to start a pilot, we wouldn't expect the cars to be at L5, like Knight Rider. No. They're going to be like... It, it's going to take some time for level 5. So level the way that I always think about level 5 versus level 3 and 4 is really that's when the car is smart enough to make all of the routing decisions based off of all of the other decisions that are going on. That's, you know, it knows it's so connect, the environment is so connected that all of the vehicles are connected, all the vehicles are connected to the infrastructure, and now it's like magic in terms of how they're able to route and all these types of things. It's gonna take a while, we gotta catch up on the infrastructure side, they gotta catch up on the, we gotta, we had to have that, um, we have to install the broad, we have to develop and build out the broadband piece of that to facilitate those types of connections. It'll happen eventually, but it's gonna be some time. So with the pilot, we expect an L3 maybe? Or? It'll be level four. The, level four. Their point to point is level four. It's, it's geofence. The vehicle is able to make those decisions within kind of almost like a little sandbox. Okay, yeah. awesome. Uh, Mayor, do you have any questions? Or? Sam, do you have any? Um, no? yeah, okay, all right. Um, can I get a motion to accept the report, please? Move to accept Second. All right, all in favor? Aye. Okay, motion passes. Thank you. Moving on to, that actually wait, we already did that. This, yes, we've concluded the so we've concluded we had on the work plan. All righty. So, uh, 
the on to open forum, Mr. Beekman. Hi, thank you. Um, I think I better finish, <laughs> try to re-speak the last few words of my speech. Uh, in other words, we may be starting a period to more fully address subjects of climate change and the future use of energy that did not want to be talked about in the early 2010s. And to talk about these changes without hurting ourselves economically or having to go to war. Thank you. Um, to speak uh, about the uh, strategic plan, uh, I was really interested in the idea that you're going to, of your hiring practices these days. And I wanted to try to offer my plug for, to, if, if, you know, I tried to talk about procurement. Um, you know, as you're introducing yourselves to, to different people and how they can work for the city of San Jose, the ideas of what is possible in the field of accountability and data collection as a process of civil rights and civil protections. I think those concepts could be very exciting to people and, and, and a, a testament to what is good about this city and why we are liking ourselves at this time, why we like to be here in San Jose at this time. Um, so I, I just thought I would offer that as a plug and uh, I, it's an important point for myself personally and that, and that I think can really help in how, you know, teaching college students, bringing in college students, the veterans uh, of, of IT and uh, who you're trying to reintroduce again. I, I think those are the kind of people who would really be interested in this sort of subject. And uh, so uh, I guess that's about all for now. Uh, otherwise, uh, thank you for uh, this process today. All righty, meeting adjourned. Thanks, everyone.